I can relate. I've been told I have a massive melon too, and uh, I just say it's more room for a bigger brain, dummy. <laughs> I always say I got a lot on my mind, so. <laughs> Welcome to Dead Headspace. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Ghana, and all other major platforms, which will include YouTube. That's right. You'll be able to watch all the uh, favorite episodes from season one and onward, including this one, starting of the uh, launch of season two, which comes out January 18th, 2021, along with a website dedicated to our guests and other content related to the show. I'm your host, Patrick R. McDonough. Alongside me, as always, is my co-host, Brennan LaFaro. Say hi, Brennan. Hello. And returning co-host, Cassie Daly. Say hi, Cassie. Hi. And we're joined tonight by author of My Darkest Prayer and the highly acclaimed novel, Blacktop Wasteland, S.A. Cosby. Hi, Sean. Hey, guys. Thank you for having me here. I don't know why my voice went up like that. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's like I'm 16 again. Let me, let me redo that. Hey, guys. Uh, how are you guys doing? Glad to be here. That's bad. <laughs> oh my god, it sounds so cool. <laughs> I'm I'm gonna leave and get Cabino to fill in for me because I can't I can't talk to him. I'm just a <laughs> Cabino, man. That's that's my buddy, man. <laughs> he, he, he's a, if you're not an asshole, he's everyone's buddy. <laughs> <laughs> so you're known for your crime, but um I don't know how no, and this is, but you also write horror, so we can yeah, we can dive into the crime stuff, of course. Um, but before we do that, what got you into horror? Well, my first foray into into reading horror, uh, my aunt was a huge Stephen King fan, and so she would read his paperbacks, and then she would hand them off to me, uh, and she'd get his paperbacks from the local um, like thrift store. Uh, you know, five and dime, pong, uh, you know, uh, Goodwill store. And so she'd read them and then she'd give them to me and I, I just fell in love with horror. And so from then on, I devoured like all the horror writing that I could get my hands on. So it's Stephen King, Clive Barker, Richard Matheson, Robert Block, uh, Algernon Blackwood, Clark Ashton Smith, um, the old, old horror writers like M.G. Lewis, uh, of course, Poe, um, uh, Arthur Macon, uh, a lot of people don't know him. He's an old name, but he wrote The Great God Pan, which was sort of a precursor to the uh, to the Lovecraft myth- mythos. Um, Robert Chambers, the, the King in Yellow. Um, I read a lot of like uh, 60s and 70s era horror. So, you know, um, Brian Lumley and um, and uh, uh, God, it's, uh, uh, Dennis Etchison was a big I was a big Dennis Etchison fan, uh, Ray Bradbury, all, all of that. I, I'm a huge horror fan. I actually started out trying to write horror, and and nobody wanted it. So <laughs> I could not sell a horror story to save my life. My horror stories got, but you know what's funny? They, they got the nicest rejections. They were like, oh, man, this is really cool. This, these are great characters. We got the great dialogue, but we, we don't know what to do with it. So, you know, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I think when I was I'm, – I'm, 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 I'm old. I'll, I'll be 46 on my birthday. And uh, I was writing horror stuff when I was, like, 14 or 15. And I think most of my horror stories were rural African-American-centered stories. I mean, they probably were shit, too, because I, mean, I wasn't a good writer back then. But uh, – I got really nice rejection letters. I remember I sent a story, to, and it's a mag. You know, and now I'm really old. Gather around, children, and I'll tell you the <laughs> days of self-addressed stamped envelopes. Um, but uh, I remember I, I wrote a, a story and I sent it to Midnight Graffiti Magazine, which was a really cool and interesting uh, horror magazine from the, it, it was founded in, in the '80s, and it lasted right up until about the mid '90s. And um, I wrote a story. Uh, <laughs> I wrote a story called Internal Rebellion about a serial killer who cannibalizes his victims, and one of the victims starts to regrow and reconstitute himself inside his body, and all his victims are like teenage kids, boys, and stuff, and um, the editor of that magazine, I can now remember his name, saying my life right now, he said, Gave me back a really nice rejection, he said, you know, there's some things you need to work on, he gave me like really concrete stuff to work on but he also really inspired me because he said you know you have talent you definitely have 
a unique voice. He said, you just need to work on these things. And and so um, I, I love, I've been a fan of horror forever. I'd love to, and you know, my writing has horrific elements. That, you know, I, even though I, I really switched to writing crime, it's a lot of visceral um, violence and physical, I wouldn't say body horror, but very visceral physical violence that can stray into the horrific. But I'm a huge, like I said, I'm a huge, huge fan of horror. I, I really like to write something um, horror centric. Actually, I got two projects, right? I'm writing a short story for a collection. I got invited to write for an anthology, for horror anthology. And um, I've got a couple other horror stories that I've, I've penned. Uh, I wrote a really cool, really gross horror story for a uh, online noir at the bar for Halloween. So that was fun. So like I said, I'm a huge horror fan. So I really like the idea of you writing horror because part of when I was reading Blacktop Wasteland specifically, um, a lot of the violence that you mentioned, I was reading that and I was like, if this was super gory and gross and scary, like this would be, I mean, it was awesome as it was, but I was like, this could be so cool, like so detailed and so like visceral, like you were saying, like, so I'm really, really excited that you're going to be writing that. Um, I don't know if there's anything, is there, is there anything specific that you can tell us that influences your horror writing? Like, I know you mentioned that you were kind of trying to do like body horror in one or maybe not specifically, but is that something you'd lean more toward to then body horror? Or are you like, cause you mentioned you were reading stuff that was before Lovecraft. Are you sort of going to go more into like a cosmic sort of thing or like, what's your goal for that? Well, for me, uh, the stuff that I like to write when I'm, leaning toward horror when I start writing horror is some body horror, but also commingle that with, with Southern Gothic, with Gothic horror. So supernatural, uh, demonic, uh, heavy on the, uh, on the, uh, Christian mythology, theology, um, archetypes, um, and mix that with body horror. So for instance, um, I'm writing a story for a collection and it's about, uh, it's about a diner in a small Southern town and uh, a character comes in and this character has been possessed by the spirit of like 500 dead slaves from a plantation. And they are, they have charged him with finding all the descendants of the plantation owner and killing them. And he kills them by regurgitating ectoplasm, acidic ectoplasm that eats them alive. And so there's the element of body horror, but there's also the element of Southern Gothic trappings that are, are race and religion and voodoo and magic and voodoo and how those, how Christianity and voodoo are sort of uh, dichotomous uh, entities or mirror images of each other. So I would say that influences my writing a lot, but I'm, I think my horror writing and some of my crime writing is much more influenced by, um, by a, almost supernatural feel, uh, almost simple supernatural atmosphere, especially in, in rural settings. So, um, but I love reading about cosmic horror, body horror. Uh, I love, like I said, Arthur Macon, who I think is, was, to my opinion, better than Lovecraft when it came to that kind of stuff. Um, and so those are influences into an extent, but I think my horror would lean more toward um, the, uh, like I said, the, the, the rural spectral uh, uh, supernatural. I remember what it was now. Um, I, I just wanted to point out real quick that it, you can tell that you read a lot purely based on the vocabulary that you use. Like it, in, in Blacktop Wasteland, it's, it's not over the top where it's like I gotta read uh, the dictionary every other sentence, like with Lovecraft. But with you, it's. You can understand it due to context, and I, I, I don't know if I'm, it's just I'm not smart enough with Lovecraft, but I need a source and a dictionary with me with him. I'm a fan of him, but uh, with Blacktop Wasteland, it's just, it, it's a unique writing voice to me, and I love it because uh, one of the reasons is the vocabulary that to use, and um, I, I don't know, that's all I got. So, man, Brennan, jump in, buddy. I thought I had something better to say. <laughs> I often do this, I, Sean. I throw in, <laughs> kind of, kind of piggybacking off Cassie's point. You know, as soon as you mentioned uh, that you do throw in that visceral, like bordering on horror element to some of the violence in your book, there was a certain scene that popped to mind that, uh, you know, I won't spoil it for readers, even though it's pretty early on, but it involved a wrench. And, uh, you know, I'm sure we can all call that scene to mind. And that's, you know, absolutely, absolutely has those uh, elements in mind. So, 
kind of moving on to Blacktop Wasteland, I am super duper interested to hear you uh, talk a little bit about kind of where you reached to to come up with the character of Beauregard. Um, what's so interesting to me about him is, you know, he's he's you you almost like at a surface level, he's that kind of Jack Reacher archetype. But there's so much more to his characterization and you know even if you strip away the really excellent you know action scenes the racing the 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 fighting the heists and all the great wonderful like page turning stuff you have such a uh, well developed character arc that stands on its own so if you could tell us a little bit about where Beauregard comes from yeah um Beauregard actually Actually started as a character in a short story that I wrote for a crime magazine called Thug Lit, and he was such an interesting character. That short story got uh, it was a distinguished uh, Mister. Uh, it was a distinguished Best American Mystery Short Story of the Year in 2016, and I was just fascinated with his character it, it, because, like you said, the arc. He is this very competent, very tough, uh, very uh, hard man. If you, if you will. But inside that is a really damaged little boy that, you know, loves his dad, that loves his mom, even though she can be mean as a snake and the complexity of those feelings and how they crash into each other. And what does that do to you as an adult? How do you deal with that? How do you navigate those com the complexities of those feelings? And, you know, I think for Beauregard, he is, he's like a lot of guys that I knew growing up that Violence wasn't their only answer, but it was always an option because they learned early on that for for certain for a certain segment of community, a certain segment of population, you know, some, sometimes people just don't understand anything except a punch to the mouth. And I, I don't mean to be flippant with that, but that that you you exist in a town or a small area, and you have the weight of you know generations of history on your back and that's the thing about small town the good thing about small towns everybody knows who you are the bad thing about a small town is everybody knows who you, who you are and so sometimes you can't outrun you know your your legacy the legacy of your name the legacy of your family and that type of pressure creates a certain type of individual like Beauregard um but at the same time I wanted him to be I wanted him to be be you know not fragile but I wanted him to be vulnerable I wanted him to you know, I wanted people to feel when he sits in that, that duster, there's a dust, there's a car in the book called uh, it's a Plymouth duster that belonged to his father. And when he sits in that car and how he feels this loss for his dad and how he feels this, the, these, these lost opportunities that he has as a person, I wanted those things to influence how he behaves and why he makes the decisions that he makes. They're not always great decisions, but they come from a very honest place. And so that's where, uh, that's basically where he came from. Now, I, uh, I I read an interview that you did. Um, I think it was uh, with David Joy, maybe. And forgive me if I'm misquoting you, but you said something along the lines of uh, Beauregard could he, he's he's the man you could become if you made the wrong choices. I wonder if you could tell us a little more about that. Yeah, I mean. <sighs> Well, I've said this in interviews before, and I've been accused of trying to sound like a badass. I'm not a badass, but I grew up in a hyper masculine environment. Um, my mother and father separated when I was young. We moved in with my grandmother and my grandmother and my uncle and my grandfather and a lot of male relatives around me that, that tried to step up and be a father for me when my father wasn't able to. But they had they were they were men that were pressed upon by race and class and poverty. And so, like I said, their answer to a lot of questions was a punch to the mouth. And, you know, I grew up, I had a really, I had a chip on my shoulder. I had a bad temper. And I, you know, I got in a lot of bite. I got in a lot of school bus fights. I lost some, I won some. We grew up behind a bar. And so we used to sneak into this bar and, you know, alcohol and testosterone usually leads to violence. And so I grew up in this very hyper masculine, toxic, tragic uh, 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 masculinity. And so I, it was, I had to do a lot of concerted soul searching and work to not 
make the mistakes that Beauregard made, you know, and, and I still have a bit of a chip on my shoulder. I have terrible road rage and I, I'm, I, I, have, I, have a, I, have a, I have a short fuse when it comes to when I feel like I'm being disrespected. But at the same time, I've also learned that those decisions have, you know, incredibly heavy consequences. And so I've, I've channeled my rage. I've channeled my simmering rage into my writing. So <laughs> I definitely hear you on the uh, road rage thing. Uh, mass hole is a term for a reason. Um, now, the nickname Bug, um, it is Bug slash Beauregard. Is that based off of someone you know, or is it a a mix of people you knew? Because uh, it, it feels just like you know that character and you knew that character even before that short story was written in 2016. Um, I mean, like I said, Bug is sort of an amalgamation of people that I grew up with. Uh, you know, he's based, I guess the closest approximation would be, I have, I had a cousin who was very similar to Beauregard. He was a mechanic, but he was also, a, 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 he liked to drag race. Where I live, I live in southeastern Virginia, and there's a lot of long stretches of road where when I was a kid, you know, we grew up in a small town. It was, it was not a lot to do on a Saturday night, and I grew up around guys who like, like to, you know, turn, as we like to say, turn ranches. And so a lot of times you would go up to the, you know, the dual lane highway that separates one county from the next, and you drag race. And I think there's a sense, because there was a sense of freedom when, when you did that, you know, I, I always say that in America, we're fascinated with the automobile because freedom is just, you know, one good car ride away. And sometimes when you sit behind the wheel of a fast car, you can forget that you're poor and that you live in a society that may judge you by your race or your ethnicity. And all that matters is that you're, you know, that your engine got a four barrel carburetor and it's a 350 and do zero 60 in five seconds. And so I had a cousin, he's no longer with us. He's passed away. And um, he was very similar to Beauregard. He was nice in Beauregard, though. He was a gentle giant. My cousin, he was a big dude. I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, we were at a drag race. I had no business being out there, by the way. I snuck out at 12 years old. And my cousin had an old Maverick that he had souped up and went to a drag race. And he won. And the person that he defeated called him a cheater. Cousin, he was a big dude. He slapped him so hard, it sounded like a, like a lightning strike. And the dude, he spun around like a top and his pants fell down. And, you know, I remember him turning to me. I remember my cousin turning to me. He had a very deep voice. He said, you don't let nobody disrespect you but one time. Make sure they remember it. And I remember, I remember that as a kid. But then also he was, a, he was a very humorous guy, too. You know, he was a very funny guy. But he was like a Mozart with motors. You know, he had never had any formal training. With, with auto mechanics, he just was somebody born that knew how to tune up wrench, tune up motors, and I had a lot of fun with him. So I think I took Beauregard's sort of uh, his sort of mechanical savantness from from my cousin, um, but I think his personality was shaped more by like guys that I grew up with. Like I said, that didn't feel like they had a lot of options. Um, but as a character, I mean, he you know he's full of flaws and and he makes mistakes and um, he's. I wouldn't say he's so much a hero as he's more of an anti-hero. And like the scene with the wrench, I mean, he's he's a he can be violent when he needs to be, but then he'll also you know play with his kids on a Saturday morning. So he, he's a hopefully a complex character. Hmm. I think he was complex for sure. Like he he had a lot of layers, like an onion, like in Shrek. Um, so <laughs> I I like that. Um, that don't laugh at me. <laughs> okay. I like that um, in the beginning there was, I mean, throughout, but there was a lot of focus in the first chapter, especially too, I think it was, um, on the different cars and stuff and the racing itself. Um, and so I liked, because part of my question here was going to be about like, if you had experience with that, which you did just explain that you do, which I think is really cool because I don't, I don't have any experience with that. I've just seen people racing on like on TV and like in Greece and stuff when I was little and I was like, oh, that's so cool. And so, um, just some little secret info for you guys. My boyfriend's constantly complaining that I'm a bad driver. Not bad, but like, he's like, you're going too fast. You need to slow down. You're going way too fast. You're driving crazy. And I'm like, look, like, he's like, you took that, like that turn so fast. And I'm like, you know what? We're safe. We're fine. So I really loved it. Like I was like, oh my gosh, I want to go drive. Like after I was reading parts of this book. Um, okay. So that was a long ramp about that. But so what I'd like to know specifically is, is there a car or is it the duster for you? Or is there a different car that maybe you 
feel some sort of connection to or that you like a lot? Or is it the duster? Like, is that why you picked that for um, b- bug? Or is there like, I don't know, one of the other cars you mentioned or just one that wasn't even in the book? Um, so the duster was picked because my cousin used to drive a duster. So that was sort of my homage to him. But for me, if I had some like real like Stephen King Lee Child money, I would love to have a Chevelle. I love the body lines and design of the Chevelle. It's the epitome of American muscle. For me, even more so, a lot of people, when you ask them what's an American muscle car, they'll say the Mustang. But for me, it's the Chevelle. There's something just, there's an inherent coolness with the, with the, with the Chevelle. There's a, there's, a, there's a sense of danger, but also a sense of, of style that comes with that car. I've driven one before. Uh, I ha- Actually, I had one when I was a teenager and my cousin and I souped it up. We put like a, we, we put like a giant engine in it. Like the Chevelle came with a 350. We put a 400 block engine in it, put a four barrel carburetor in it. It had a nitrous kit, which is like an additive that you can shoot into the gas to make the car go faster. Um, that car would get up. And I got two speeding tickets in the same day when I was 17 and my mom made me sell it. And so I would love to get that car back and have it as my own car to like maybe a tool around in. Um, but I think just to reiterate uh, something about cars in America, I think, again, there's a sense of freedom and, and a sense of individualism that comes with the car. I mean, that's why I think cars are such a big part of American culture. Um, you know, you can get behind the wheel of a car and you can jump on the road and within four hours you can be anywhere you want. You know, full tank of gas and a lead foot will get you um, anywhere you want to go. And I think that that's just something that a lot of people can identify with. Excuse me. So I think that's why people, I think, I hope that's why people are connecting with the, with the book, in addition to the characters and the situation and the plight that they find themselves in. Now, you know, I mentioned earlier that I loved the characterization, especially around Beauregard, but you also just can't discount the way that, like, the action scenes are written. And I'm I'm wondering how you kind of taught yourself how you learned to write that kind of, you know, fast pace doesn't let up prose. How do you go about that? What's your process like? Um this is going to sound really nerdy, but for me, the physical layout of a sentence on a page is reflective of the action that's going on. So it's like for instance, if you're describing a fist fight, like anybody hasn't read the book, there's a fight that happens at Beauregard's garage. Some guys come to confront him about something and he didn't do what they think he did. And the fight breaks out. And what I like to do is I'll write. Re- if you go back and look at that section, they're really short, choppy sentences. You know, they're four word, five word sentences, because for me, that's almost like a a a, a textual representation of what a fight feels like um, when the driving scenes are different. They're more, the, the sentences are longer. I write like sentences that are almost a paragraph long because it's a different type of physicality. It's a different type of action. So when you're in a car chase, and also you 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 you, you can alternate that. You can write a really long sweeping paragraph about how the car feels, how the engine is thrumming up through the steering wheel, how you can feel the motor and, and hear it roaring like a pride of lions. And then you stop and then you can intercut that with a really short sentence about, you know, the the interstate, you're running out of road. And what that does for me, and I hope it does it for the reader, it, it helps to better create an image in their mind. It's almost like stage directions. It's almost like blocking out a play. And so uh, I, I, I kind of came up that that technique from just the, the type of books I like to read. And also, I love movies. And I read a book about screenwriting a long, long time ago called Story by Robert McKee. And I translated his advice about screenplays and how to write action screenplays into writing action scenes in prose. Um, and for me, it's just an interesting way to really pull the reader in to the story. What The thing that bores me more than anything else is somebody who writes a fight scene that's 12 pages long. Because, like I said again, I've, I've, I've had my ass kicked and I've kicked some ass and most fights are not that long. And so you lose people with a fight scene if it's more than two pages. 
I, I firmly believe that. I think you'll lose the reader. It's just like now, to relate that back to horror, it's like if you're writing a horror story and your monster is breaking into the in, down the person's door, and they're breaking in the bedroom. Well, you know, nobody wants to read 10 pages of description about the door and where it came from and what the doorknobs look like and, you know, the splinters on the floor. You want action. You want to feel that monster. You want to see that claw reaching through the hole in the door and grasping blindly at the doorknob. You want to create that sense of suspense. And I think that's true with action. I think all suspenseful writing, whether it's horror, whether it's crime, uh, you want to create a sense of immediacy. And for me, structuring my sentences and my paragraphs that way is it helps. Absolutely. Um, y- you know, and I'm, I'm a musician, so I'm not going to argue with you on like the rhythm of a, uh, uh, of, of certain prose. Um, and that, um, the whole thing about writing an action scene and kind of punctuating it with short sentences, that's something I've been trying, I've been working on, uh, pretty recently. I think I, first read that in uh tim wagoner's book that he had come out which i am totally blank oh writing in the dark is the name of that one um but yeah that's that's such an effective tool absolutely i've heard that and i want to say brandon uh sanderson said that too had advice about that in a fight scene maybe it was a different fantasy writer but um I try incorporating that when I when it applies, where basically when there's an action scene, since it was a fantasy scene, talks about um, someone with a sword fighting like a big troll, and you want to feel like you're out of breath um, by the end of it, because that's kind of like you said, a rep- representation of what the action is dictating. Um, uh, Cassie or Brennan, anything else on this subject, or can I go to my next question? You can go for me. Okay, um, so I kind of want to go behind the scenes of Blacktop Wasteland, because you never know, someone could listen to this episode years from now, and they, you know, chances are they may not have uh, read it yet. Um, a lot of people so far have read it, and just to name a few... Uh, you got blurbed by one of the biggest badasses in crime. Uh, he's actually um, probably regarded as one of the best crime writers, Dennis Lehan. And uh, you got Lee Child as well. So um, how's that feel, man? I mean, Stephen King, blur- not blurbed you, but he tweeted about you. That's like on Twitter for horror writers. That's like the that's that's like the Medal of Honor, man. Like, how how does all that feel? There's you got the what is it the best book of the year mysteries and thrillers for amazon you're up there on goodreads choice next to uh sylvia marino garcia's uh, uh mexican what was it yeah it's mexican gothic there's too many things to name how, how does that how do you take that in because I, I don't know how i'd react you're just gonna fangirl over there freaking out i I have to at least one time because and i'll just put this out there my favorite book for 2019 was sean hamill's a cosmology of monsters my favorite book uh and i've read a lot of good ones of 2020 is your book uh i wanted to tell you that on the show it's i i knew it'd be my favorite after reading the first uh chapter it's just it's so good that's me i'm done fangirling um so yeah carry carry on <laughs> oh thank you so much for that man i appreciate it it's it's over it's, it's overwhelming but you don't let it get to your head like for instance the Stephen king thing Stephen king mentioned my name the fact that Stephen king knew who i was was like the culmination of like 30 years of reading his work. I, it made me even like forgive him for the ending of the Dark Tower series, which I didn't care for at the time. Um, it's just, <laughs> it's, it's overwhelming, man. It's, it's incredible. Oh, man. I, I love his work, but I was not, a, it's grown on me over time, but I was not a fan of that ending. But anyway, um, it's like Dennis Lehane, man. Dennis Lehane is somebody who is on my Mount Rushmore crime writers. You know, he's one of the best crime writers of the 20th century. Um, so when those things happen, Happen. What keeps me grounded is, as a writer, 
it's the three you go through a, three stages when you write. You come up with an idea and you think, oh man, that's pretty cool. That'd be all right. I think that's pretty cool. And then you get into writing it and you're like, what the hell am I doing? Why am I doing this? I don't know what the fuck is going on. Jesus Christ. And then at the end, you think, eh, it's all right. It's not bad. It could be better. I always trying to get better. And so those, you know, those platitudes and, and plaudits and, and, and awards and, and commendations are great. It makes me realize that, okay, I can keep doing this. I should keep doing this. And it, it inspires me to just write more. It doesn't make me think like, oh, well, you know, I'm on my golden throne, you know, with my scepter and my, you know, chalice. It makes me think, okay, I, I'm, I have the chops to do this. I want to get better. I want to keep doing this. I want to keep telling new stories and, 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 and stretching my, my, stretching my muscles, my mental muscles and just creating better uh, sentences and maybe cut back on some of the metaphors and, and just become a better writer. But at the end of the day, it also, it's, it's mind blowing because these are people that I have idolized, you know, Walter Mosley, Dennis Lane, Lee Child, you know, people like that, people that I have, I have, you know, gone to the store, you know, to buy their books. I got a book signed by Walter Mosley like 10 years ago. And then a couple weeks ago, I was doing a podcast with him. It's just a magical world, man. It just, I would never, five years ago, I was i was a retail manager at a hardware store loading concrete on the back of people's trucks. So if I can do it, anybody can do it. That's awesome. And then just to throw one more thing out there, uh, Mudbound co-writer Virgil Williams is adapting in your book into a, into a movie. I mean, uh, can you tell us anything about that? Any your how you feel about it or really anything? Oh man, that's just that was just the mind blowing. It's like my mind's blown. It's like no, here's Virgil Williams, an Academy Award nominated screenwriter, who's gonna write the screenplay to your movie. Now my mind's even more blown. It's been it's it's like it went from being obliterated to annihilated. It's like what the hell? But I actually I got I got a chance to talk with him, and uh, you know he's a really intelligent, insightful guy. And I feel really comfortable with him adapting the story. We're on the same page. He gets what I'm trying to do and what I was trying to say. Um, but it's also surreal. I can't believe that this is happening. I mean, I believe it, but at the same time, it's like somebody's going to come along and pull a plug. and I'm going to wake up in the matrix with a whole bunch of holes up on my arm like Neo. So it's like, <laughs> it's crazy. I just, I just, I'm just going to enjoy the ride for as long as it lasts. Mm. Now you you probably don't have much input in this, but if you could cast Beauregard or you know anybody else you want to talk about in the book, if you had control over the casting, dream casting, who would you go with? Okay, here's my dream cast when I was writing the book. This is what I thought of in my mind. All right, Beauregard is Mike Coulter. I don't know if you know him, but he was uh, Luke Cage in the Luke Cage Netflix series. Mm, yeah, so that's Beauregard. <laughs> Timothy Oliphant is Ronnie Sessions. Uh, Jared Leto is Reggie Sessions. <laughs> <laughs> but you got to scuzz him up. You got to get real scuzzy. Uh, Zoe Saldana is Kia. Uh, Walter Groggins is Lazy, Mo- Lazy Mother's Ball. Um, there's a guy named Tommy Flanagan who was on a show called Sons of Anarchy. He played the character Chibs. Um, on that show, he has... He has actual real distinctive facial scars. He would be Burning Man. Burning Man is Lazy Mother's Ball's uh, right-hand man, his, his head henchman. Um, and uh, uh, Mahershala Ali is Booney. Um, and then, uh, uh, who else is in the book? I, I, oh, and uh, for a flashback, for a flashback, uh, I want, um, <laughs> this is funny, for a flashback, I want either Sterling K. Brown or Michael B. Jordan to be Bugs' father, Anthony. Oh, and, and Angela Bassett is Bugs' mama, Ella. So that's my dream cast. Can Can Gary Oldman be somewhere in there, just like a bystander? I think because he's he would just like he's one of my favorites, man. <laughs> I, I'm curious. I can see Gary Oldman as a. Uh... Oh, sorry. I, didn't I can see Gary Oldman. Old... Oh, no, I can see Gary Oldman as Lazy Mother's Ball because I think he could do that really good Appalachian Southern accent. So, 
I, I think, though, Walton Goggins is a perfect choice for that. Are you a fan of Justified? It feels like you poached the cast a little bit there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love Justified. It's one of my favorite TV shows of all time. I've watched the series. I've been watching the series from beginning to end three times. I love. And I'm a huge fan of Walter Goggins. So he was in my mind when I wrote the character. Um, as far as I understand through the uh, the movie folks, uh, there are folks. There are folks that I've mentioned that are interested. I can't say which ones that I mentioned that are interested in in the roles. But there are folks that I just mentioned. Some of those folks are interested in doing a role. So I just it, it would blow my mind to see that man. It would blow my freaking mind to see that. We got it. It honestly feels like Sean is walking a similar, a very similar path to Josh Mallerman, Man, I mean, after we talked to him. It just sounds like everything's clicking for Josh uh, back in 2015, like it is for Sean right now. It's it's awesome. I love it with him in Bird Box. It's it feels similar. I, I, met, Josh, I met Josh Malman last year. Uh, he was at a convention in Virginia. Uh, There's a convention called Scares for Cares. Um, huge uh, horror uh, convention as a charity. Uh, um, uh, and it's funny we met last year. We talked, the book hadn't come out yet, and he was really nice, he's really funny, super cool, uh, very interesting guy, and uh, a couple months ago, he read the book, and he gave me this really great blurb. He basically said, I don't know if you can, he, on tweet, Twitter, he tweeted about it, he said, this is one effing great book, and I mean, he, and he I'm sure he doesn't remember what we met, but that was a really cool thing, he's a really cool guy, so that's, I mean, he, I just want to say that. Josh is one of the nice. He's pure happiness and joy. Yeah, he is cool. Um, and I, you know, I almost regret asking you that question about your cast because, like, that's it. That that's fantastic. It's great. You know, Power Man as Beauregard. I'll take that. Um, Cassie, I'm throwing it to you. Okay, so well, if you guys have more about the specific thing, you can ask because my thing's going to go kind of like in a different tangent a little bit. Have at it. Okay, so. There were two things. So that you just mentioned Matrix like a little bit ago, which I love. And then in the book, I was reading it and there was like a Les Mis reference, which I was immediately, Les Mis, there's Les Mis in this book. And I got super excited about it because I really like Les Mis. So I want to know what are some of your like favorite movies or shows? I already know you just mentioned the one that you love for them. Um, but tell me, like, what are some other things that you, and it doesn't have to be horror. It can just be anything. I'm just nosy right now. I just want to know what you like. <laughs> Oh man, I love. Uh, I have a huge. I'm a huge cinephile, so I watch all types of movies. So yeah, I threw a Les Mis reference in there, but I love sci-fi movies, love horror movies. Uh, you know, some of my favorites. Um, I'm a huge fan of like, for instance, for like horror movies, I love the Skeleton Key. I think Skeleton Key is so underrated. It's so underrated. It's such a creepy damn movie. It's it gets under my skin. It's so creepy. Um, uh, uh, like movies, I love monster movies. So I'm a huge fan of a movie called Affliction. It's a great vampire flick. Uh, I love uh, uh, I love odd movies, like like really weird uh, avant garde movies. There's a movie called uh, Trouble in Mind um, from the '80s, starring Chris Christopherson and Keith Carradine and uh, Genevieve Bourgeois. Uh, I love David Cronenberg stuff. Uh, Dead Ringers is one of my favorite films of all time. Jeremy Irons should got an Oscar for that movie. It's an incredible performance. But also, I love Jeremy Irons in a, a domestic drama called Damage, which it, it came out in like, okay, I'll tell you a funny story about Damage real quick. So, I love, like I said, I love, love movies. So, I'm a child of the 80s and 90s, so I love going to the video store. And one time, we went to the video store, and my mom was like, you can pick whatever, pick three movies you want, they have a special going on. So, I picked two horror movies. I picked, I picked Silver Bullet, staring and, uh, Corey Haim and Gary Busey at his most, ma that's Gary Busey's best role, Uncle Ray, and I love that, that freaking movie. So I picked Silver Bullet, I picked a really horrible exploitation movie called Junior, which is about, like, basically it's about these two women that escape from prison, and they end up in Louisiana, and there's this psycho, big, giant dude named Junior, and it's, it's got mama issues, and it's really horrible exploitative sex. But when you're 12, it's great. It's, it's masterpiece theater. And I got a movie called Damage, starring uh, starring uh, uh, Juliette Binoche and, and 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 Jeremy Irons. And it, 
I got it because the cover was very salacious. It was very sexual. But it was like this heartbreaking movie, man. Yeah, there was some really gnarly sex scenes, but it's this really dark, heartbreaking drama about a dude who falls in love with his son's girlfriend, but they don't know that they are connected and they have this really torn affair. And then the son... He like falls off a balcony. It, it was very dark. So my uh, my my movie interests are all over the place. But uh, also, like I said, I love Les Miserables. I love Rent. I'm a huge fan of that musical. I'm not a fan of musical in general, but I love that particular musical. Um, I love uh, uh, one of my big interests outside of movies and books is art. So I'm a huge fan of Renaissance paintings. Uh, I'm a huge fan of that. Of like Rembrandt and that kind of period. Also, American uh, uh, naturalistic artists like Andrew Wyeth and Edward Hopper. I'm a huge Edward Hopper fan. Right before the pandemic, I got to see an Edward Hopper collection at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. And that's, I'm so glad that we got to see that before everything shut down. So my interests are all over the place when it comes to like, and those things, those things also influence my writing. Um, I, I use a lot of sensory dependent imagery. And what I mean is I use a lot of imagery that's dependent on a lot of writing that's dependent on taste and touch and feel and sight and smell. And um, the very, I write, I try to write in a very tactile way because I want the reader to be in that world. And so I talk about the colors of things, how things look, you know, I talk about the color of sunset, you know, looking like, you know, blood red burgundy spilling across the sky like somebody turned over a drink and things like that. I use that kind of imagery to create a sense of of atmosphere and a sense of place. So art and artists are, I'm a huge fan of stuff like that. So like I said, I, I went to Metro Museum of Art and we were in there for like three hours and it was just one of my, one of the greatest things, one of my greatest experiences. I'd never been there before and I got an opportunity to do it last year and it was amazing. So I'm a huge fan of, uh, I have a lot of, weird interests. I go down a lot of rabbit holes on Twitter and, and YouTube, so my interests are all over the place. I'm so I, I rambled on that, so I'm sorry. No, I, I liked it because I, so I've been to the Met one time. I've only been to New York once and I, um, I started at the Natural History Museum and then I walked across Central Park and went to the Met and I'm not a super sciencey person. Like I like sci-fi and stuff, but I'm not super like science minded. Um, I just, my brain just doesn't <laughs> work with it super well. So I was like, oh, cool dinosaurs and like geology and stuff like that. But then we went to the art museum and I was like, oh my God, this is the coolest place I've ever seen in my entire life. And I was like, I was like uh, Pat just a few seconds ago when he was telling you about your own accomplishments. That was me to the paintings and to the art and stuff. Like I was so <laughs> excited about it. <laughs> so go on all the tangents you want about that. I love it. I just did. We're in the same boat. <laughs> Speaking of Gary Busey, I just had to point this out because you mentioned him, Sean. Who was speaking of Gary Busey just now? Hey, he mentioned him, so I just had to, <laughs> I had to ask. Did anyone watch I'm With Busey? It came out for one season. Uh, it was just basically a day in the life of Gary Busey. I watched it, and it was great. Yeah. It, was like, it, was like, it was like watching an LSD so trained run off of a peyote laid down track it was the greatest thing ever i loved it i love gary Busey. he's so crazy but it's like <laughs> he's also this incredible you know he's insane but then he's mr joshua and lethal weapon he's uncle red and uh silver bullet you know he's this great great actor who happens to be totally bonkers so I, i'm a huge gary Busey fan i love silver bullet that's one of my favorite movies um i, I love silver Bullet because Uncle Red reminded me of some of my uncles who were like kind of wild like that. But if I told them there was a werewolf uh, outside my neighborhood, they would shoot him. You know, I could see my uncle Isaac uh, pulling up a gun and making a silver bullet and like, we're going to kill this son of a bitch. I, I just grew up with guys like that. So, speaking of silver bullet, one of the greatest werewolf movies ever made ex until you get to see the werewolf in full. And he looks like a giant teddy bear. And I don't understand why they did that. But anyway. <laughs> I like his son, uh, Jake Busey, and I first watched him in, uh, when I was like, I was born in 89, so when Starship Troopers came out, I was eight, and uh, I, I, I watched that show like a million times afterwards, but Jake Busey, he's, uh, he's like a, a tamed down version of Gary, it, it's just, it's it's fantastic watching, watch the two of them. Have you seen The Frighteners? Have you ever seen the frighteners with uh alec uh with uh michael j fox and and jake busey hmm. uh jake busey does a great job in that movie that's such a dark it's the early peter um oh god the guy who did jackson. lord of the rings uh peter jackson he used to be, no, uh, he used to be a horror director he, he made yeah he he made one of the grossest 
gross out horror comedies ever made called Dead Alive. It's just, it's, oh my. It, well, I'll tell you like yes. this. It ends with a with a, a lawnmower uh, massacre, uh, and Peter Jackson wrote and directed a movie called The Frighteners with uh, 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 Michael J. Fox as a, a a medium who has these two ghosts that he's connected with, and he gets the ghosts to go into people's houses, and then he comes in and and exercise them, and they run across a actual demonic presence. So he did uh, the fright and Jake Busey plays a character in that movie that's insane. Uh I love the fright and it's again really underrated uh flick that nobody really talks about anymore. It's so cool like the history of horror movies. There's so many people that go into like I'm going to say mainstream because it's so weird to say horror is mainstream. It is, but it's its own thing and I don't think I can really explain it beyond that, but there's so many Famous celebrities that start out in horror, and it, I don't know, man, it's just the best. Someone take over. <laughs> I mean, look at the orc scenes in Lord of the Rings. I mean, there's <laughs> there's a lot of uh, yeah, and, and also I'm thinking of uh, the like three and a half hour version of King Kong. He did like the the scene with the natives is absolutely freaking terrifying. Um, yeah, Peter Jackson definitely hits his roots every so often. Yeah, another another actor that was in um The Frighteners was um uh Chai or Chi McBride, who is who's one of my favorites, another really underrated guy. Um and he's one of those actors like you've definitely seen him in like 10 things, you just don't know it. Um I loved him. he was in a show that was on uh maybe like 15 20 years ago called Boston Public where he played a uh, uh, principal in the uh, Boston public schools. And that was a hell of a show. Um, and this is going nowhere, but Hey, I just wanted to talk about Chai McBride. Cause he's a no, really awesome actor. He's in, he's in pushing daisies. That's one of the few names I know. Cause I'm usually really bad at names, but he's in pushing daisies, which if you guys have not seen that, it's like my favorite show. It's besides Buffy, but it's so good and beautiful and colorful. I, I grew up on like early eighties horror. Uh, like I said, I'm, I'm old. So I'll, I guess I'll be 46 in a, a few months. Um, but uh, while I got you guys here, if anybody's listening, there used to be a syndicated show called Friday the 13th, the series. It wasn't about Jason Voorhees. It was about these two cousins who owned an uh, anti shop that sold an- cursed antiques. And they had to go like recover all the cursed antiques. And it was in syndication for like three or four years look that up it is it is one of for 89 to like 91 when it was on on tv it has some of the weirdest darkest most violent horror episodes ever and it shouldn't and was made in canada so i think it slipped under the censors radar when it got syndicated and um there was a guy named john d lemay who ironically starred in the series, then went on to star in uh, an actual Friday the 13th movie starring Jason Voorhees, an actress who went by one name, Robay, and a guy, uh, uh, another older actor named Chris Wiggins. And Friday the 13th, the series was like really, really good. It, it never took off, I think, the way they wanted it to because they named it Friday the 13th, the series, because it was from Canada. But um, it's that old, every episode was like this really cool, self-contained horror movie. And uh, it, it was a really good series. And uh, a, a friend of mine named Chad Williamson, who's a, horror, uh, a crime writer, uh, him and I could talk about that, that series for hours and stuff. But anyway, uh, like I said, I, I love horror movies, so don't get me going on that. I never knew about the series, and I'm looking it up right now. And my goodness, they the logo on it looks – you have to do a double take. It, they definitely knew what they were doing with the uh, text and um, the, the graphics on it because – Right away, if I don't do a second look, I'm like, all right, that's the f- no, it's not. It's not the film. It's not his mask. It's a uh, it's a skull. <laughs> Those crafty butt butt heads. <laughs> um, Watch your language, Pat. Yeah, fuck you, Brennan. <laughs> Why did you say Cassie? I was gonna say. Oh yeah, sorry, that came out in a weird order. Cassie, you're just like Cassie. Said- fuck you, Brennan. <laughs> Oh, because Brennan threw me off. Cassie, um, I thought you had a follow-up question, and if you didn't, my apologies. No, I don't I don't think so. I just wanted to know which movies and stuff he liked, and I wrote down a bunch of them. <laughs> I like movie recommendations. This is something I ask a lot of people. You guys should know that. <laughs> Sean, what does the A stand for? I know it's your middle name, uh, but I, what, what does – is it Anthony? No, I'll tell you. So, okay, here's how I got my name. My mom liked two things when I was born. 
She loved Sean Connery, and she loved. There used to be a really cheap champagne that was sold in mm-hmm. grocery stores called called Andre. So she loved the champagne. So she meant the A is for Andre, and she loved Sean Connery, but she didn't like the way he spelled it. So she spelled it S H A W N. But I'm named after Sean Connery, and I'll tell you another funny. All my life. Up to a few years ago, she's gotten a little older now, and, and uh, we don't uh, we don't uh, take we don't get together like we used to with family. But all my life, every time we have a big family get together, we like Thanksgiving, they would play like a 007 a James Bond movie on the TV. <laughs> and my mom, if like, we're looking at the TV and every year, she's like, "My God, that's Sean Connery. That is a good looking white man. Good gosh!" And I'm like, <laughs> "Can you just pass the mask, potatoes? Just pass the damn mashed potatoes. I don't want to hear you thirsting over Sean Connery while I'm trying to eat some goddamn sweet potatoes pie. But anyway, that's where my name comes from. I'm named after a, a Scottish actor and a cheap champagne. Is it? And uh, I'm so glad you asked that. Me yeah, too. I thought it would be an interesting answer. I did not think <laughs> Sean Connery would be in there. Uh, did she call you when he died? Or was there anything that happened from his death? Oh yeah, she was devastated. She 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 calls me and she's like, Sean. And I'm like, what's going on? What's going on? She's like, Sean Connery died. I said, yeah, I saw it on online. And she's like, my gosh, I never got to meet him. And I'm like, when were you gonna meet him? You're 75. He's 100. When was that gonna happen? I don't know where. And then I was like, and then I, my dumb ass, I asked her a follow up question. I'm like, what? Why did you want to meet him? She's like. Well, you know, me and Dad have been separated for a number of years, and I don't know. He's just a very – that's a sexy white man. Goodbye, Mom. Goodbye. <laughs> so that's what happened a few weeks ago when she passed away. <laughs> so this is a weird segue, but uh, I did um, – I know you saw it, but for those that are not aware, uh, there's another interview – I'm sure there's many – podcast uh, interview with um, – Unnervin's Eddie Generous, and in it you do talk about how one job you want to do was being the FBI, and right away I've talked about it on the show a lot. Arguably, it's hard to say what your favorite out of you know whatever there is for books, because like you, I have a large uh, range that goes beyond horror. Um, Lord of the Rings is one, but I one of my favorites where if you put a gun up to me and I have to pick one trilogy, it, it might be Thomas Harris's. Uh, Hannibal Lecter series. I and fuck Hannibal Rising, man. I hate I hate that fuck so much. I wish it wasn't me, but I bring it up because one, you write horror, you write crime, uh, you want to be an FBI agent. I'm interested if uh, you like the that series, and also if there's any other FBI related books that you're a fan of, uh, particular Mindhunter, if that was one of them. One of them. Oh man, I I love um I've read you know I've read the trilogy I I love the first two books in the Lecter trilogy I love Red Red Dragon and Silence of the Lambs Hannibal it's, it has its moments I'm not a big as big a fan of that I think <clears throat> I just I didn't agree like I said agree that's the wrong word I didn't enjoy the ending of Hannibal but Red Dragon oh my god I read Dragon I read Dragon when I was like 15 and it, it's such it's a horror novel masquerading as a crime thriller. It really is. You know, it, it is. It's like if you took Dracula and you put him in a cell, and then you took Frankenstein and you gave him a pair of friggin', uh, you know, uh, uh, custom made dragon teeth. That's Francis Dollaride and Hannibal Lecter. Hannibal Lecter is Dracula, except he's not a vampire. And Francis Dollaride is Frankenstein. Or the Wolfman, really. Well, the Wolfman's a more apt analogy, but he just doesn't, you know, grow fur. And I love. I've read. I've read Red Dragon, God, five or six times. That last line, you know, it's not, you know, I'm men that are haunted. It's Shallow that's haunted, and Shallow doesn't care. That last line, oh my God, it's just Shallow isn't haunted. It's men that are haunted. Shallow doesn't care. That last line is so powerful, and it's just, I love that series. Um, for me, you know, of course, that's part of the pinnacle of the quote unquote ex FBI behavioral science uh, uh, subgenre. I read the Mind Hunter book that the series is based on by John Douglas. I really enjoyed that. Um, that's about it. When I was a kid, I wanted to be an FBI agent because I liked the TV show, The FBI. 
And I just thought it would be cool. But as I got older, I did a lot of dumb shit when I was like 15 and 16 that would preclude me from going into the FBI. And so I don't think you can get in the FBI if you got like misdemeanor uh, bar fight assault charges. So I gave up on that. But uh, I, I love Thomas Harris's work. I love Silence of the Land. And like I said, they're horror novels. I'm actually working, well, I'm actually starting a, a, a project, a book that is going to sort of be my interpretation. It's a serial killer crime novel that I want to do, but I want to do it in conjunction with making it a Southern Gothic novel. And so um, basically, I'll take you all the elevator pitch real quick. Basically, it takes place in a small Southern town, and it's about a guy who's a sheriff in a small town. He's the first black sheriff in a small town. And on the one-year anniversary of his election, there's a school shooting, but it's not a mass shooting. Only one person is killed, the local... uh, a high school science teacher and the person who kills him commits what's called suicide by cop. And after he's killed, the police discover that the killer and the high school science teacher were involved with a third individual who is unknown. And they were a trio of serial killers and they had been killing young uh, African-American boys and men for like 10 or 15 years. And so the sheriff investigates this crime and uh, finds out that the, the killings weren't done in a small town, but the bodies were hidden in a small town. He's trying to find out who the serial killer is. At the same time, there's this huge, like, you know, far right uh, Confederacy uh, parade that's going to happen in this town. And so all of these things are happening at the same time. And he's a former FBI agent who left under inauspicious circumstances. So that's something that I'm probably going to start writing. And I've been outlining and researching it for about six months. Um, but I, I love the idea of the FBI. The reality is kind of boring. But yeah, Red Dragon, man. Anybody that's listening, if you haven't read Red Dragon, get, rectify that immediately. That is a, a horrifyingly beautiful piece of Red Dragon that will make you flinch. And I have a pretty strong stomach. My day job is at a funeral home, so. But there are scenes in Red Dragon that will, will, will make you want to stop reading the book for a few minutes and go watch a Disney movie. So definitely read that book. Um, often when I see, because it seems to be a cyclical question that pops up in the horror community, what's the scariest book you ever read? Um, it's always Red Dragon for me. I love The Silence of the Lambs, and like you, I like Hannibal. I'm okay with the ending. I know it's not my book, but um, I I like the movie's ending better. And I do agree that one, the Red Dragon and the Silence of the Lambs are, like, those are the two best ever, man, for crime, horror, or however you want to label it. But Red Dragon is definitely creepy. Francis Dollar Hyde, I don't know, man. I, I think I'd shit my pants if he was in the same room as me. For, go ahead, Brennan. It's a dark uh, book, man. There's stuff in there's stuff in Red Dragon that I remember reading, and it's like I probably should not be reading this. I don't think I'm mentally, I don't think I'm mentally capable of handling this right now. Because you know, there's a scene in Red Dragon where somebody gets their lips bit off. Yeah, I, I'm not exaggerating. Literally, someone gets their lips bit off, and I remember reading that. And I'm like, well, that's pretty fucked up. I'm gonna stop for a, a while. I'm like I'm gonna go I'm gonna go read a Hardy Boys mystery because I I need some distance from this. It's like, but you know it's funny. The scariest book I've ever read, and I think it's I'm looking at it through the the, the lens of nostalgia. For me, Salem's Lot is still up there, man. Salem's Lot scared the shit out of me. I'm gonna tell you how much Salem's Lot scared me. Salem's Lot scared me so much that I stole my grandmother's silverware. And I took her butter knife and I slept with it under my pillow for like three weeks when I was like nine or 10 years old. First of all, I shouldn't have been reading a damn book, but I made a uh, I made a tongue depressor cross and I had a her real silver butter knife for like two or three weeks because I was convinced that Ralphie Glick was going to come to my window. There are scenes in Salem's Lot that and like I said, I'm a grown ass man that still atavastically get under my nerves. You know, I have this this visceral response. The scene in Salem's Lot where the uh, the two guys have to drop off the box, which we all know now has the vampire in it, and they take him down in the basement of the Marston House, and they're they're freaking out, and they get back out, and they get in the truck, and they realize they haven't left the keys. They were supposed to leave the keys, and they play like uh, uh, rock paper scissors to see who goes back down there, and that guy has to go down and put those keys on that on that table. 
that scene, God, that is such a masterfully suspenseful. Nothing happens, but the atmosphere and the sense of dread that he creates is just claustrophobic. It's overwhelming. You feel like somebody's strangling you as you read that scene or the scene where Ralphie and his brother are walking home through the woods. And for a country boy like me, I grew up walking, you know, uh, down dark roads at night. It's so atmospheric. It's, and, you know, you can tell Stephen King is a guy who grew up, he may, you know, he's a billionaire or whatever now, but he's a guy who grew up poor and he's a guy who grew up in a rural area because he knows how to hit those notes and how sound has this weird, uh, you know, phantasmic sound quality to it when you're walking through the woods at night and how it just creates this sense of overwhelming horror and, and terror. And, and that, like I said, Salem's Lot, man, God, that book still to this day, I, I reread it every Halloween and I, I, I love it just so much. That's probably the scariest book I've ever read. Yeah. And that's, that's, I would agree with that. It's probably my favorite King book, but it's also, you know, whether it's your favorite or not, it's probably easily one of the scariest ones. And for all those reasons that you put way more eloquently than I think I ever could. But uh, so what I want to ask you now is you gave us this nice uh, background starting all the way at the beginning of the episode, taking it all the way up uh, to now about horror writers you grew up on King Barker, uh, Arthur Macon. Um, what, what horror writers that are a little more modern are you reading now? Well, like we said, we mentioned Josh Mallerman. I think he's great. Um, there's a guy, uh, he's no longer on social media, but he's still writing. Um, an independent writer named Ed Kurtz. Ed Kurtz is probably the best horror writer that you don't know. And I mean that euphemistically. I'm sure you guys may have heard of him. Um, the Rib from which I remade the world. Uh, uh, you know, uh, he, he, he uh, uh, blood, blood. Oh God, he's got a really great catalog. He writes a lot. He's very prolific. Um, but he's probably one of the best horror writers a lot of people haven't heard of. And he he is this guy who seamlessly melds crime and horror together. I did a, I did a live reading with him in uh, Delaware one time where he read a story called uh, Baby. And it was about these two drug mules who had swallowed a bunch of condoms full of drugs and they're trying to smuggle drugs into, into the country out of Mexico. And one of them dies. The man is a man and a woman. The man dies. And the woman's like, I got to get these drugs. I got to get these drugs. And she gets a knife and she opens him up and disembowels him to get the drugs. And as she's doing it, she finds that he has a uh, a primordial twin, a, 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 an, an in vitro twin that he had digested who's alive. And so she takes him out of his, the, 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 her lover's body. And she has like a psychotic break and she tries to nurse him. It is the darkest shit I've ever heard. And I remember being in a bar. We did it in a bar. And I remember people getting up and leaving because they just couldn't handle it. I I watched like four people walk out. That's not an insult to it. That is the highest compliment a horror writer can get. That there were people who were like, nope, I can't deal with this shit. I'm out. So Ed Kurtz, yeah. The ripple which I remade the world. Uh, no Beast So Fierce, uh, Sawbones. He's a great contemporary horror writer. If you don't know him, search his books out. I mean, he's just, uh, and, and if you ever, he also did the uh, audiobook version of The Ranger, which was a uh, um, a low budget horror movie. He We call him the voice, <laughs> I probably shouldn't say it. We, call, we used to call him the voice that makes you moist because he has this incredibly uh, melodious voice. He's, he's And he's such a great guy. He's really a great guy. I've, I've had the opportunity to meet him a few times. He's a wonderful writer and a wonderful person. So Josh Malerman, uh, Ed Kurtz, uh, I think um, uh, uh, Sylvia Moreno uh, Garcia, uh, Mexican Gothic. She's uh, a really great horror writer that I really enjoy. On that, that, that a lot of people are, are finally getting to, to know. Um, I think um, I'll tell you an old school horror writer that I like that um, he doesn't write anymore. He uh, uh, he started his career as Poppy Z Bright, uh, but he's transitioned, uh, and his, his name is Billy Martin. Um, when he was writing as Poppy Z Bright, oh my God! It, it, Poppy, if you again, if nobody, if anybody's listening, look these books up: uh, Exquisite Corpse, Lost Souls, Drawing Blood, and Are You Loathsome Tonight? I, I I wish he would go back to writing horror because he, t- 
to me, he was the heir apparent to Clyde Barker. He was that good. He was that good. Um, very, uh, and he was writing, you know, uh, um, uh, queer centric LGBTQ horror and books when it wasn't fashionable, when people weren't as open to it as they are now. Um, and I, I mean, I read Lost Souls like four times. I love that book. It's a, it's one of the best modern vampire novels I've ever read. So that's somebody that uh, he, he doesn't write any, he doesn't write professionally anymore. But yeah, definitely look up Poppy Z. Bright and his early work. Um, and then also uh, one of my favorite, um, I would say one of my favorite current horror writers uh, that I really, really enjoy is Paul Tremblay. Uh, I hope I pronounced his name right. Paul Tremblay, Tremblay, Tremblay. I love his work, man. I, I think the Cabin in the End of the World, Survivor Song. He, 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 he is a, a he's very, he's very much like Stephen King, where he writes in a very Americana realistic way uh with just regular characters in extraordinary circumstances um so definitely check him out i think he's really great i'll tell you another person um that's that's an independent writer is not uh as well known as as some of these other folks is a lady named kanisha williams um she writes uh uh really african-american centric horror novels uh, vampire novels. Um, she's an independent writer. Um, she's got a heavy presence on Facebook uh, and on Twitter. Uh, check her out. She writes really good, like, like I said, African American subject horror movement novels and vampire novels and and, and witch witchcraft novels. She's really great. Uh, and so uh, those are some of the ones that I really really enjoy. Um, that I really enjoy their work and uh, um, I really like what they're doing. Um, so those are a few off the top of my head. It's funny that you mentioned Ed Kurtz because I was going to bring him up. Um, the reason being is because we got him, you and I got a mutual friend, which is Dongji, Dongji Gam Bepko, uh, his fiance. Um, she is awesome. I beta read one of her short stories. She's actually sending me a, a older um, collection. I don't know the name on the top of my head. I, I love talking to her. She's fantastic. I'm trying to get her and Ed to come on the show next year. Um, Ed's a little shy, understandable considering what happened in 2019. Um, but Ed is someone that I want to read. Uh, haven't read the, the rib novel yet. I heard a lot of good things about it. I asked Cam if I could, if I could, uh, repeat the story she told me about you and it's, it's not a bad one. It's funny. So I'm, I'm going to read her words and she gave me the, okay, this is the first time she met Sean. We got it, but I, uh, wait, I jumped ahead. <laughs> I still remember the first time I met him and Eric Pruitt. We attended a noir at the bar in Baltimore at the pizza place. We were outside waiting for Ed to finish his cigarette, and we had seen some odd folks walking by. Then suddenly, we, we hear someone singing, and we see it's, uh, we hear Ed's name in the song, and it's Ed. Ed's like, what the hell is going on? Next thing we know, they get closer. It's Eric and Sean singing, I want to sex Ed up. <laughs> That's the story. That is the whole story, which leads me to ask you, Sean, can you fill in the blanks? <laughs> or sing for us, either way. So so let me let me preface this story that both me and Eric were highly intoxicated. <laughs> and... Um, we were we were we were good and drunk. We were we, we had just left a friend of ours house to pregame before this uh live reading event in Noir the Bar at Zella's uh pizzeria in Baltimore. And Eric, we had driven around the block and we saw Ed and Gam on the sidewalk, but they didn't see us. So Eric Eric Pruitt is one of my best friends. He's a crime writer from North Carolina. He's a writer, a uh, filmmaker, musician. Uh, he's a renaissance man. He's a redneck renaissance man. I love him to death. And so anyway, Eric came up with this idea and he's from Texas. He has this deep Texas accent. He's like, you know what we should do? We should just sing an erotic love song to Ed Kurt it's when we come down the sidewalk. And I was drunk. I was like, yeah, fuck it. Let's do it. And so we come down this hour and we're like, we want to sex you up and curse all night. And, <laughs> and Ed first freaked out. But then he was like, I'm with it. Let's do it. Let's go. We weren't prepared for that. And so we ended up going inside and having some whiskey sours. And uh, let me tell you, I'll tell you, man, I hope you get Ed to come on because Ed is not only, like I said, has first of all, he has 
one of the best voices in in crime fiction. If you want to hear somebody read, Ed Kurtz has a voice that should be doing voiceovers for uh, major motion pictures. He is one of the most inventive and interesting writers around. And you know, we all know stuff that happened, unfortunately, with the with the situation last year. But um, I, I think Ed is probably, like I said, one of the best writers that a lot of people just don't they don't know yet. And I'm so glad he's still writing um, because, like I said, some of his work he wrote a crime novel that called Na- Nausea, which is a, a horror crime novel about a hitman who develops a psychological aversion to violence, that he can't commit violence anymore. He gets sick and he throws up. And and how he has to, he tries to uh, get over that by committing more and more horrendous acts of violence. And it escalates and escalates. And just, like I said, he's just the most inventive writer. He's incredibly pro- prolific. And uh, like I said, the guy, he, he, he came over, he has a quote and I, I talk about it sometimes. He says, you know, crime and horror are just kissing cousins who kiss in the dark. And that's <laughs> such a great quote. And that, that's an first original. So, yeah, I mean, uh, after, uh, you know, after I heard on the Brian Keene's horror show about uh, cheesing and Ed, I was like, all right, well, I'm a reviewer, so I'm going to reach out. And that's when he left. So I haven't gotten a chance to talk to him yet, but. That is a goal of mine for next year. What? That was it. Uh, Brennan, uh, I think you had a question. Yeah. Um, so, Sean, you have another novel coming out next July, also from Flatiron. Um, I actually kind of have two questions if you just want to talk for a while. Um, I'm kind of curious how you got hooked up with Flatiron in the first place, but also if you could tell us a little bit about Razorblade Tears, that would be awesome. Okay, so let me tell you the story about how I got hooked on Flat. So in 2018, I went, there was, there's a big uh, ministry convention every year, well, every year till COVID, uh, called BoucherCon. And it, it's in different places around the country. And so in 2018, my book, My Darkest Prayer from Intrigue Publishing was coming out in January of 2019. And so I decided to go to BoucherCon uh, it's, you know, Entry Publishing is a great company and they're an independent company. So I took some copies, some early uh, advanced copies of the book, and I decided to save my money and go to BoucherCon and try to promote the book. So while I was down there, Pruitt, again, uh, he was putting together a panel, and the panel was on Southern crime fiction. And he asked me, did I want to be on the panel? I was like, hey, man, you know, I've written some short stories, but I don't even have a book out yet. And Eric was like, man, fuck it. Come on, let's do it. And that's always Eric's ethos. It's like, fuck it, it'll be all right. And so I got on the panel, and on the panel was me, uh, a gentleman named Ace Atkins, who's a great Southern crime writer, and uh, he also took over writing the uh, Smiths for Hire books after for the uh, Robert Parker uh, estate after Mr. Parker passed away. Um, there was a lady named a young lady named Steph Post, who's a great crime and fantasy writer in her own right, and Alex Segura, who's a great crime writer. But he also just wrote a, uh, a Star Wars adaptation about Poe Dameron's early years. And so none of that happened yet. This is in the past. So I'm on this panel and I had a great time on this panel and we talked about race and class and everything that comes along with Southern writing. We talked about everything from Walt, you know, from Walt, William Faulkner and Eudora Welty and Flannery O'Connor all the way down to Justified and Northerners trying to write Southern uh, uh, dialogue and all of that. So at the end of the a panel, this lady gets up and she says, swear to her hand to God, she says, I understand that the antebellum time in the South was hard for some people, but I really miss that time and the manners and the etiquette of that time. And you could hear a pin drop in that room. Nobody said shit. And Eric turned to me. He's like, Sean, you want to take that question? I'm like, I would love to take that question. (laughs) I said, well, ma'am, I understand what you're going through. You feel like white people are becoming a minority. My folks have been the minority for 400 years. We're going to get through this together. I'm going to teach you how to drive while white, and I'm going to teach you how to deal with a security guard that follows you around a store when you're not doing anything wrong. Me and you, we're going to get through this together. And she got upset and left. And so after the, the panel broke up, I was heading to the lobby of the hotel, and a guy walked up to me. He tapped me on the shoulder. He said, hey, my name is Josh Getzler, and I'm an agent. I really like what you said in there about writing, and I like the way you handled that, that really rude woman. Do you have anything you're working on? I said, well, 
I got this Southern Heights novel with an African American lead called Black Dot Wasteland. I just finished it. He said, "Well, when you get home, he gave me his card. When you get home, send it to me." And I didn't send it to him for a couple of weeks. And uh, I was like, "Oh, you know, what's the worst can happen? I'll send it to him and see what happens." So he took on Black Dot Wasteland in November of 2018. He sold it to Flatiron Books in February of 2019 for a two book deal. And that's that's how I got with Flat. Um, and uh, none of that would have happened except for that, that racist lady in the panel. So thank you, racist lady. I appreciate it. Um, but um, Razorblade Tears is a crime novel about two fathers, one black, one white, whose sons, whose uh, gay sons were married. And at the beginning of the book, they've been murdered. And these two fathers who are ex-cons, who are men of men of violence, decide to investigate the crime uh, to avenge their sons, but also to redeem themselves because neither one of them uh, were very accepting of their sons' lives and their sexuality. And so it's a novel about revenge and grief and violence, but it's also a novel about redemption and growth and how love is just love and and uh, nothing, should, uh, nothing should interfere with that. And that, you know, the people in your life it doesn't matter who they lay down with at night as long as you love them and they love you back. And so it's a novel that's very personal to me. I have a cousin who uh, came out a few years ago and there were members of my family that um, were, uh, were not receptive to that. And I, I wanted to write a novel about homophobia in the South and rural communities and the idea of what masculinity really is. Um, but I wanted to do it through the prism of a crime novel because in all honesty, I really, I really wanted to fuck up some bigots. So, like, so there are horrific. <laughs> there, are, there are horrific. Uh, I'll tell you a little. I'll tell you guys a secret. There's a little essay Cosby. Anytime somebody in one of my books uses a pejorative term, whether it's a racially pejorative term or a sexually pejorative term or a misogynistic pejorative, pejorative term, at some point before the book is over, they're gonna get their teeth. <laughs> that's just something I like to do because you don't get to do that in real life. So, but the book again it has my it has violence in it that borders on horror specific violence. I mean, there's a scene where somebody gets their head caved in with a with a tamper, which is a garden tool that you use to uh, uh, flatten dirt. Um, there's scenes where people get their fingers uh, snapped. There's a there's a really big shootout uh, towards the end, and and then there's a lot of violence in the book because these are men of violence and that's the only way they know how to communicate. But at the same time, they're growing and, and becoming better men. And so they're redeeming themselves for being really insensitive fathers to their sons. And so um, it's a book that's very special to me. And I, I hope that people, um, I hope that people connect with it uh, uh, on, on, a, on a level just beyond just the, the genre. Um, Whoever wants to jump in to reply to that, go for it. But before we do that, I just want to make sure I got it right. What is that, BocaCon, or how do you how do you spell that? It's BocaCon, B O C H E R C O N. It's named after a guy named Anthony Boucher, who in the twenties and thirties was one of like the founding fathers of early uh, crime writing. He uh, also, uh, he edited like uh, mystery magazines and sci-fi magazines. And he was a big proponent of, well, a lot of people don't realize that in the 20s, 30s and 40s, crime writing was seen as, it it still isn't to some extent, it wasn't held in very high esteem. You know, it came out of the pulp years, out of the pulp uh, genre. And so people just didn't think very much of it. And you know, crime writing, mystery writing can be literary. It can it can ascend to heights of you know of, of literary excellence, just like uh, any other type of writing. Any it's, whether it's you know plays or, or or scripts, crime writing can examine the human condition in the same way that you know uh, William Faulkner does or John Cheever does. And so he was really, and he he died tragically. And so his friends. Um, who were like people like, you know, um, the, the writers behind Early Queen magazine and, and early mystery writers put together a convention to celebrate his life. And over the years, um, that convention has become like the preeminent uh, celebration of mystery writing. And every year they give an award. In 20, last year I, I won the uh, Anthony Award. It's called Anthony after Anthony Boucher. Um, I won the Anthony Award for Best Short Story 
in crime fiction. And so uh, it, the, the Anthony the Boucher, Boucher Con has been very good to me over the years. And I'm hoping and cross my fingers that we'll actually be able to attend it in person next year. So. Absolutely. Now, um, you know, you mentioned that uh, crime writing kind of has that reputation of, you know, not being able to compete with uh, literary genres. But I mean, reading Blacktop Wasteland, I would argue that. And Pat had his moment to fanboy earlier. I'm going to take mine now. Um, reading through that book and, you know, anybody who listens to this show on a regular basis knows that I'm constantly in the middle of like five, six books. I have that, you know, bad case of like reading ADHD. I, I got through chapter one and I couldn't go to anything else. I, uh, I, I had to plow right through this book in about two days. Um, and I went from not being experienced with your work at all to, I'll be picking up uh, Razor Blade Tears on day one. Um, you got me sold, dude. Oh man, thank you guys so much, man. I, I, you know, it's funny. I um, I love. You know, I think there's these very, very narrow-minded walls between genres. You know, I think you know people will tell you, oh, you write crime fiction or you write horror, but you know that's okay. But it's not this. It's not as important as you know, say, a thousand acres by James Smiley or the corrections by Jonathan Fratson. But you know, I disagree with it. I think crime and horror, are, and in some in the right hands, like I said, can examine you know the existential milieu of human existence in a way that maybe no other genre can. You know, you take a movie, you take a horror novel like Lord of the Flies, right? And it deconstructs the bonds of society and what makes us civilized. Or you take a horror novel like, you know, um, The Damnation Game by Clive Barker. And you talk about, you know, not just the, the old, you know, uh, cliche of you sold your soul to the devil, but are you worse than the devil? Uh, you know, can human beings, you know, dive to such depth? So depravity that they make the devil look good by comparison. And so I think and with crime novels, you take a crime novel like, you know, you take something like uh, Darkness Takes My Hand by Dennis Lane, which if you haven't read it, pick that up. Um, and it talks about the futility of violence and how it's cyclical and how it drags you down. And so, I, you know, I think genre fiction is just as important and just as necessary as, you know, what you would consider, uh, you know, elbow patches on the blazer literary fiction and that's not to that's not to disparage that kind of work because i love that kind of stuff you know i love a thousand acres i love james smiley i love john irving john irving is one of my favorite writers he wrote the world according to garb he wrote the hotel new hampshire um uh widow for one year i mean he's got great he's one of our great american writers but i think you know his work i think stephen king work can stand up against his work toe to toe and is just as good and just as important and just as vital i think work by writers like Chester Hines, you know, it, it's just as good and just as important and just as vital. I think people get too bogged down in genre and not looking at quality. And, you know, they like, oh, it's a horror novel. Well, that can't be good. That's just monsters ripping people open, you know, and disemboweling folks. Yeah, it has that, but it also has honor and integrity and loyalty and complexity. And, it, you know, it has, you know, passages where you think about what it means to be human. You know, you, you read Frankenstein, and Frankenstein is a great mediation on what is humanity. You know, is Frankenstein, you know, Frankenstein is actually maybe more honorable than Victor, than his creator. The monster is, you know, Victor creates this monster and then just abandons him. He runs screaming from the laboratory and leads him to his own devices. You read Dracula, you know, and Dracula, you know, of course, you know, Bram Stoker wrote Dracula. It's a little bit of a penny dreadful, but at the same time, it talks about love. It talks about loyalty and, and dedication and, 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 and coming together for the common good. So I think people get too wound up in genre distinction and not looking at the quality of the work. Absolutely. No question. Um, you know, and I, I've, I've read the corrections. I'm sitting here with it right now. It's, it's fine. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's a good story and it certainly examines the human condition, but in as much as, uh, King's 11, 22, 63 does in as much as, uh, St Stephen King's revival does, um, and to, you know, discount, uh, looking into 
let's say Beauregard's character development, uh, say, seeing you know how his choices and how his um, environment kind of reflect him as a character when his you know so many of the things that he has to do that lead to the story, the plot in Blacktop Wasteland stem from the fact that he's a black mechanic in the you know and losing business to a white mechanic. Um, it, it just because that's the way the state he lives in, the town he lives in uh runs i mean that's if that's not if that's not the human condition if that's not understanding the way that humans and society operate i don't know what the fuck is <laughs> yeah i mean you know like black Tower wasteland i mean it is a heist novel there are car chase scenes there's violence there's a wrench scene that if you read the book you know don't don't read that scene on an on empty stomach but uh <laughs> You know, but there's also scenes where he's talking about violence and how he feels like it's a curse that he's handed down from his father to him to his children. He wants it to end with him. You know, he wants it to stop with him. You know, it, it, there's scenes where he talks with his best friend, who happens to be his cousin, Kelvin, and he talks about what he wants for his children. He, he wants better for his kids, you know. And at the end of the day, Black Top Wasteland has a story of choices. And it's a story of, you know, it's, it, it asks the question, are you who you are because of where you come from? Or are you who you decide to be? And like you said, if that, and I'm not trying to aggrandize myself because there are crime writers way better than me who have asked that question in way more eloquent ways. But I think the same thing with horror novels. You know, I mean, you read House of Lee and it talks about the idea of existence. I mean, how much deeper can you get than that? I, I don't understand. I really, it really bugs the shit out of me when you read a review from somebody who reviews a horror novel that doesn't like horror, I don't understand why that happens. And the person tell you in the review, I don't really like horror, but I read this book. Well, then you ain't the person that should be reading it. You know, you, I don't know why you're reading it. You should stop and give it to somebody that likes horror novels and let them examine it. But I mean, you know, there are horror novels I've read that have moved me. Richard Lehman, who a lot of folks don't, don't maybe don't know anymore, wrote really complex, searing, horror novels with real characters with real situations you know um i love um there's a there's a novel god chelsea kane chelsea kane wrote a novel called heartsick which is a crime novel a horror novel masquerading as a crime novel and the, the character the lead character of archie and his relationship with gretchen lowell who's basically a female hannibal Lecter. she's beautiful she's exquisitely beautiful and she's but she's like you know she's like this 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 peach that you pick off a tree and when you bite into it, it's full of maggots, you know? And their relationship is a great microcosm of, I think everybody's had one, of a toxic relationship with someone that you, you just can't get away from, but you know they're no good for you. And I mean, if that's not important, if that's not necessary, then nothing is. Then we're all just fiddling our fingers, twiddling our fingers in the dark. Yeah, I don't really know how to follow that up. I agree. Uh, so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna move on to a book that you suggested that I, uh, and an author that you suggested. I wasn't aware of that. I just want to echo on this episode for maybe more potential readers, which is uh, Rachel. I think I'm saying her middle name right, Housel Hall. Uh, the book is, and now she's gone, which. I am eagerly waiting for that as a known Christmas present, thanks to you. <laughs> uh, do you have anything that you want to mention about that book or her? First of all, Rachel Hosell Hall is one of the best crime writers working today. And she started out writing police procedurals, but she's moved on to books that are that straddle the line between suspense thriller. I wouldn't say horror, but they're very suspenseful. She is just such a great writer when it comes to deconstructing the interior lives of her characters. She knows her characters maybe better than 90% of the writers that are out there. And so uh, she wrote a book last year uh, called All Fall Down, which was a reworking of Tin Lone Indian, Indians, or, or I'm sorry, uh, was well, and then there were none by Agatha Christie. And it's the way she does it and the way she makes you buy into this char character is just remarkable. I love her work. And I've met her in person, and she's such a nice person. She's really funny. You know, I'm, I'm telling you another writer 
that uh, I don't know uh, that straddles the line between horror and crime. Um, Jennifer Hillier, she wrote a book a few years ago called Jar of Hearts, um, which is just gosh. I'm gonna tell you what Jennifer did. That's great. She has a lead character in that book that the first three chapters you do not like this character, but she's so compelling. You have to see what happens to her. And real quick, Jar of Hearts, the plot of Jar of Hearts is about a young woman who uh, uh, her boyfriend, uh, uh, when you were in high school, killed her best friend. And then years later, uh, she she gets she had helped him hide the body. And then years later, he gets arrested because he becomes a serial killer. And she uh, has to pull like some time in jail for helping him hide the body of her friend. And when she gets out of jail, she has to start her life over. You know, she had got out of high school and gone to college and become an ad exec and was living this high-powered and really interesting uh, sex-in-the-city life, and then she had to go to prison. And so when she gets out, uh, she tries to build her life back up, and um, he gets locked up, and then he escapes, and he comes looking for her. And at the same time he's looking for her, his killing startup again. And John Hartz is so just multi-layered, multi-faceted, faceted. it's this really dazzling trip into the heart of darkness and, and, and the in, again, the interior lives of 17-year-old boys and girls. And it makes you question yourself because we all, you know, when we were all 17, our emotions, I think, were deeper, our reactions were more extreme, and are we the same person at 17 that we are at 27? And I think she answered that question very well. And she had a book out earlier this year called Little Secrets, which was also a really good thriller, horror, suspense novel. So, yeah, if anybody's listening, check out the work of Jennifer Hillier. She's she's really, if you like horror novels, you like suspenseful novels, definitely check her work out. I appreciate that. I'm definitely taking notes, man. Dude, seriously, uh, I was going to say, I've taken like an entire page of notes of just recommendations <laughs> and then also like a quote from earlier that you did that said like, violence isn't the only answer, but it's always an option. Like I have an entire page of notes. I feel like I'm in class right now, like through this episode. <laughs> you know, I just thought of this because Cassie, me and Brennan, we, um, we, we're in a chat room just to make sure we're in, in sync so we don't interrupt each other. And uh, she was taught, Cassie brought up how good of a, a guest you would be or whatever the proper term is on a panel. I just thought of this. The coolest thing that I, th- I think would be awesome for not, not even our show would be is you, Gabino, Eric, Ed Kurtz, whoever else, for just like a crime slash horror discussion. I'd, I'd, I would not talk at all. I'd be like, go ahead, fellas. <laughs> I would bring a notebook for all the notes I would take, not even joking. <laughs> It would be called Hustle. Me and Gabino and a guy named Nick Corporon did a, a panel last year at George Mason University in, in, in Northern Virginia. And it was one of the, the most enjoyable panels I ever had because we're, we're all animated in different ways. And then you throw Eric and Ed on there, man. I mean, I would, I, I, like I said, I, I've had really fun panels with all those folks that you mentioned. And I love as you can probably gather by now, I love writing, but I love talking about writing. I love talking about the art of writing, the craft of writing. I, I admire so many different types of writers. Um, and so, you know, I always tell people that want to be aspiring writers, if you want to be a hard writer, that's great. Read hard writers. Read D. Lewis. Read Edgar Allan Poe. Read, uh, uh, you know, Fritz Lieber. Read... Uh, you know, of the early, like reading, you know, Mary uh, Shelley, read early, uh, you know, horror writers, read modern horror writers, read people, you know, that are writing horror now, uh, read old, you know, there was a huge movement in the 80s of splatterpunk writers, like with Krista Faustus and Poppy C. Bright and Caitlin Kiernan. Um, you know, read those folks, read everybody, but then go read something out of your genre. Go read something that maybe doesn't fit your genre. If you want to be a crime writer, read Raymond Chandler and read Ross McDonald and read Walter Mosley and read, you know, uh, uh, George Pelicanos, but then also read something outside of your normal stratosphere because that's how you get to be a better writer. You, When you read a lot, you learn what will work for you specifically and what won't work for you. You know, I read something like, if I read a book like, um, like a Thousand Years of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. And that's a book that's magical realism in Mexico. I realized, okay, I, I'm, I, that's not my wheelhouse. I can't do that. 
But what I can do is write something maybe in a similar vein, in a similar way, and put my own spin on it. Or if I read something like, you know, you go and read like an old horror novel, um, like you go and read like a, um, something by like, say, you know, one of the early Algernon Blackwood. You read the original Wind, Wendigo story by Algernon Blackwood, or you read something by, um, you know, uh, uh, Richard Matheson is a really people don't read Richard Matheson as much as they used to. And my God, he's you know, he wrote the original I Am Legend story. He he was a master of different genres. He could write sci fi. He could write horror. It didn't matter. He could combine horror and sci fi together in a way that a lot of people can't do anymore. He was a masterful short story writer. Uh, read a lot of short stories. Short stories will teach you more about writing than I think any MFA program you ever have. Because short stories, you got to get in, you got to get the plot going, and you got to get out. And I think that teaches you the economy of language in a way that, you know, uh, uh, I think is, is incredibly beneficial. There's a great short story by Robert Block called The Animal Face. It's like seven pages. It's one of the most disturbing stories I've ever read. It really is. It's it's about this dude who's hitchhiking and he gets to this 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 uh town fair and um he hooks up with this dude who has this gorilla in a cage and he takes this gorilla from town to town and this guy then tells him a, it's a story within a story. And the guy tells him a story about his niece who was uh murdered by some, you know, in 1950s everybody that was a bad guy was a greaser. And he talks about uh what he did to get back at them and stuff. And that book has one of the best closing lines of any short story I've ever read in my life. Robert Block's Animal Face. Probably one of my favorite short stories of all time. But read a lot of short stories. They'll teach you, like I said, about the economy of language. You know, every writer, I think, sometimes gets uh, linguistic elephantitis where you write these really long, overdone phrases and overdone paragraphs. And you really, when you, I think, you learn to just, the best advice is in a, E.B. Strunk, E.B. Is, is Strunk and White's Elements of Style, and there's a line in there that, it, it's a very thin book, it's like 30 pages, but one of the lines that I've always taken seriously, and Stephen King talks about it in his book on writing, is eliminate needless words. Best advice you ever get as a writer, hard to put into practice, but it's 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 really true. Eliminate needless words. Take out words that don't work. If you write a paragraph and you can take out a word and it doesn't change the paragraph, then you don't need the word in the paragraph in the first place. And so I, I tell anybody that's trying to be an aspiring writer, read a lot, uh, study other great writers, study writers that you admire, but don't pigeonhole yourself when you read just to your genre, um, because that gives you a very flexible and adaptable mind when you start writing your own work. Yeah, that that's. Well said, man. Uh, outside of the genre of crime and horror, my favorite biographer is uh, Walter Isaacson. For those that don't know him, he's done the first book I read by him was Steve Jobs, and I just fell in love with it. Uh, he it's not he doesn't write boring stuff, man. He, not even the subject matter, but the way he writes about them, it's kind of like you're either reading it in a it's weird to explain it this way, but you're kind of like both reading it in a uh, newspaper article, a well-written newspaper article, or you're kind of just like sitting, listening to this interview live. Because he interviewed, I think it was hundreds of people that knew Jobs, um, talked with Jobs before he passed, he wrote uh, Le um, Leonardo da Vinci, uh, Benjamin Franklin, Einstein, because he's fascinated by geniuses, and that's, I am as well, I... Uh, He's my favorite. Um, I was curious if you've read any of those books by him. Or there's another one called The Innovators, where it starts with um, Lovelace, a Ada Lovelace. She was the first computer programmer back in the uh, mid 1800s. Uh, the computer, mechanical computer, was made by uh, Charles Babbage. He, I believe, he couldn't finish the computer because the parts didn't exist back then, which is just so strange to think about it. So I didn't know if you have ever. Yeah, I, stuff. I read a book by uh, a guy. I cannot think of the author's name, but it was about Alan Turing, who was a mathematical genius during the World War II, who created the, the Turing test, which people still use now to determine whether or not an artificial intelligence has gained sentience. 
Um, and he was a fascinating character. Uh, I love reading biographies too. I read, I read, I've read the biography of Alexander the Great, Peter the Great, which is Peter the Great is one of the great biographies. He's one of the great individuals in history because he literally pulled his nation kicking and screaming out of the Middle Ages. Um, and I've read biographies of Shaka Zulu and Gandhi. And I love biographies because, you know, it's real stories about people that really persevered. Um, I'm a big fan of his. I used to read a lot of Stephen Ambrose. He read, he wrote a lot about the American West, about you know undaunted courage, the, the Lewis and Clark story, and Band of Brothers and stuff like that. So I love stuff like that. But yeah, I, I tell anybody that's trying to be a writer, read outside your genre. That doesn't mean you can't, you know, sit down and read stuff that's really interesting and really I- I- intriguing in your genre. But it just gives you a broader uh, palette from which to paint, so to speak. So I definitely enjoy. But then also I love reading like really uh, dark. Uh, esoteric stuff within the genre, uh, very nihilistic stuff sometimes too. So you know, I, like I said, I I, I have a a, a a a multiplicity of interest when it comes to reading. So yeah, Todd Keeslin's good. At that. <laughs> that whole uh, just morbidity, dread, uh, just gruesome violence. Not in all his books, but I'm gonna throw I'm gonna put you on spot real quick. It's a flat iron uh, book that I saw at my local Goodwill because um, I have not read any flat iron books until I uh, blacked off Wasteland. But this one caught my eye due to the cover that I saw was through flat iron. I was like, all right, well, I like the first one. It is uh, called The Night Tiger by I think it's pronounced Yang Ji Chu came out a year or two ago. I was curious if you or Cassie or Brennan have heard that. If so, have you read it? I haven't, no. Okay. Nope, me neither. Okay. Me neither. I've heard of it, but I haven't read it. I actually have it. It's in my my uh, towering to-be-read pile, which at, at this point, if it falls over, it's going to like shift the axis of the earth. So I haven't got a chance to read it yet. I, have a, I, mean, you, I think what I'm currently reading, though, um, that's really good, is a Southern Gothic book called Blackwood by Michael Ferris Smith. Um, Really good, dark Southern Gothic. Very uh, emblematic of uh, of Flannery O'Connor, which if anybody is listening doesn't know Flannery O'Connor, is one of the uh, founding members of the Southern Gothic uh, literature movement with Eudora Welty and William Faulkner and Harry Cruz and Charles Wilson and uh, other writers from the South. Um, uh, Very it very intricately, uh, beautifully uh, written book uh, that is borders on the supernatural, but never goes all the way into the supernatural, but just incredible writing, just poetic writing, beautiful writing about ugly, ugly uh, 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 events. So that's what I'm currently reading right now. Mm. Uh, sounds pretty damn cool, man. Uh, I, I just had one more uh, question. Um so I asked you, I told you privately that I was pursuing a crime book that's been in me and it's not straight up crime. It's like a, I would describe it as horror crime. Cause I, I loved our, uh, the red dragon book and, and the science of the lambs. So it's along those lines and you had really good advice that I never heard before. So I was wondering if you could park that on, uh, other people listening. And if you had any other advice for people that want to pursue crime specifically, Yeah, um, basically, to paraphrase what I said earlier, because I, it, it, when we talk privately, it's basically, I, I tell people all the time, when you want to write crime stories, it's, it's important to understand your characters and why they're committing the crime. Too many people start writing crime novel with the idea like, I want to write this cool heist. Or, I want to write this really tough, violent character who beats up people and you know breaks their fingers and knocks their teeth out you know, with a hammer and a chisel. But you need to really delve into your characters and understand why they're committing crimes. Because behind every crime, behind every great crime is is great pain, I think. And, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, but like with Beauregard, if you read Elmore Leonard, Elmore Leonard is a great crime writer and his characters come, they commit crimes because they're desperate. They're broken, they're damaged. They're people that are, at the bottom of the barrel and the end of their rope, and they feel like they have no other choice, you know. And you know, crime and great crime to war is bad is bad people doing bad things for what they believe is the right reason. 
And if you want to be a crime writer, you got to understand that. You got to understand where your characters are coming from and, and just them morally. You have to let them live and die and stand or fall on their individual intrinsic motivations. And I think too many crime writers or people who want to write crime don't understand that. They just want to write a tough guy or a tough gal. They just want to write somebody who's a badass. In my experience, most badasses don't have to tell you they're a badass. They show you through their actions. And so just, you know, I just said reiterate, just remember great crime noir is, is, is bad people or damaged people doing bad things for what they believe are the right reasons. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so we're, we, we've taken up a lot of your night, Sean, um, and you've had a lot of uh, insightful and hilarious things to say. And uh, you even sang for us, which I really appreciate personally. Me too. Um, Thank you. <laughs> so I want to ask you, um, you know, you, you actually kind of uh, jumped into what we usually end with, which is what are you currently reading? But if you're reading anything else or if you've read anything recently that you'd like to shout out, uh, take that minute. Shout it out. Yeah, uh, I, 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 a couple of things I read recently that I really, really enjoy. Um, I read um, My Sister, the Serial Killer by Okinawa Braithwaite. That was really good. It's a, uh, a novel that won best, uh, I want to say won best paperback novel last year at Bartracon. That was really good. Um, this is something that was new to me, but it's a book that's been out for a long time. But any horror fans out there that really enjoy visceral, dark horror, um, you want, might want to pick The Troop by Nick Cutter. That was a really dark horror novel uh, that uh, really pushed the envelope of of visceral body horror in a way I hadn't really, uh, really come across in a while. Um, there's a writer I wanted to shout out really quick, uh, a bizarro, two bizarro writers. And I, I say that with all love and, and with all respect. Um, one is named Jessica Mahew. Uh, she's written a lot of novels and stories over the years. Uh, I want to say that I think she wrote a novel called the green rabbits, which is a really dark bizarro drug fueled horror novel. And also a guy named Will Vahario. Will Vahario is a character man. He's the real most interesting man in the world. Uh, and he's written, he writes about a character named Vic Valentine. When you start reading the novels, it's like, oh, this is a 1950s era hip cat detective. But then it careens into dark, incredibly dense, uh, sexually, uh, 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 sexually interesting, uh, bizarro, surreal uh of fiction. I mean, he starts out as a detective, but then he's fighting the Yakuza, and there's demons who work with the Yakuza, and, and I mean, he's a really interesting character and a, as an individual and a really interesting writer. Um, the, uh, another couple books that I've read that I really enjoyed uh, recently was The Indians by Stephen uh, Graham Jones. That was remarkable. That was Stephen Graham Jones, man. That dude, he's on another level. He is. If we're all down here scribbling in crayon, and that Joker's writing with a quill pen dipped in the blood of gods, I mean, he's incredible. That guy is just amazing, man. Um, Win Winter Counts by David Heska Wanabli Whedon, uh, which is a uh, indigenous crime novel that takes place on a reservation uh, with a, a really uh, interesting character named Virgil Wounded Horse, who's a uh, basically a unlicensed. Uh, enforcer for the reservation. Uh, that's a book I read recently. I really enjoyed. Um, that came out early this year. Little Secrets by Jennifer Hillier, who I mentioned earlier, is really good. I read that recently. I really, really enjoyed it. Uh, when These Mountains Burn by David Joy, which is a rural noir story that I really liked. Um, I tell you a book, and I don't remember the writer's name, so forgive me. That was really dark and really fucked up, but I really enjoyed it. It was a book called Cows. C O W S, cows by the dude that works in a book, uh, uh, slaughterhouse, and I cannot for the life of me remember the guy's name, but it's a short horror novel called Cows, and it's it's probably the most fucked up shit I've read in a while. That that's a really really fucked up book, in a good way, in a good way, and it's just like if you talk, if you like body horror, if you like extreme horror, that's not gratuitous, that's not misogynistic. Yeah, read Cows. And I'm so sorry to the author. I cannot remember his name. 
Um, but I, I got it on a Kindle deal and it was really, really interesting. It was really good. Um, two books I want to shout out, really, or three books I want to shout out before we go that I always try to shout out because I really think they need more attention. My friend Eric Pruitt wrote a book called What We Reckon, which is like a Southern Gothic crime novel uh, about a, a guy named Jack and a girl named Summer who are uh, more than brother and sister, but less than lovers and their adventures as they try to get rid of a kilo of cocaine in the East Texas summer. That's a magnificent, wonderful book. Um, also, uh, another Southern noir book, book called Cotton Mouse by Kelly J. Ford, uh, about a young uh, LGBTQ, uh, uh, a lesbian uh, a young lady who comes home after having to drop out of college and uh, hooks back up with her childhood crush, who is now involved with a guy who's selling meth. And all this fit takes place in uh, uh, the winter in, in a small Arkansas town. Cottonmouth is is Cottonmouth is beautiful. It's 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 like drinking this really good shot of whiskey in this really dark messed up cup that has spikes on the lip. It's a beautiful book. Um, I love that book, man. I love Cottonmouth. I've read Cottonmouth three times. I really enjoy it. Um, I'd like to shout out uh, my friend since you guys are giving me this this moment. Uh, if you like cozy mysteries. My friend Kelly Garrett is, wrote a mystery called Detective uh, uh, called Hollywood Homicide, which is a really fun, funny kind of palate cleanser after like cotton mouth and, and cows and, and stuff, which is a really fun little romp through Hollywood in uh, the late 2000s. And also uh, one other person I'd like to shout out uh, real quick that I think is uh, on the, uh, has a really interesting book that I've just finished about two weeks ago, man, and I, I've been, I'm still thinking about it. It really, uh, it, it it really got to me, man. Um, is a friend of mine named Nikki Dolson who has a book called Love and Other Criminal Behavior. It's a series of interconnected short stories. Um, that book really got to me. So those are, I read a lot. So that's sort of my list of things that I've read recently. I'm sorry I went on another tangent. I apologize for that. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> that's that's what I got. No, please. The only person who's mad at you about that tangent is uh, my wife looking at my bank account. Um, I <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of really good stuff you've recommended and you know sold me on. Um, I I have um, the Green Kangaroos by Jessica McHugh sitting on my shelf. That's a uh, that's a perpetual motion machine book, and you know that's a that's a quality publisher that I'll trust every time. Uh, you mentioned Stephen Graham Jones, you know, sitting up there writing his books with the blood of the gods while the rest of us are scribbling <laughs> in goddamn crayon. Um, and, and even his book that he just announced, My Heart is a Chainsaw. I mean, he, he released like a, you know, several paragraph blurb and ju- or uh, excerpt rather. And it just it, that's something I got to have. And it doesn't come out till like next August or something like that. He's just he's on another level. Um, Kyle's, Kyle's is quickly interrupt. Kyle's is by Matthew Stoko Stoko S-T-O-K-O-E. Stokow. <laughs> that's my next note. Is that Pat is living on Google and he's going to have the answer for who wrote cows any second now. Oh, uh, no, that's uh, actually. Pat, while well, you have the floor, what are you reading? So just recently. Uh, what is it? The Gulp by Alan Baxter. Sorry, that and End of the Road by Brian Keene. Um, and then to throw a third in there, my first Robert Block book, which would be Psycho. So uh, I bought it. It's the first time I've had a used book smell like cigarettes. So <laughs> I guess it was uh, well enjoyed. <laughs> uh, Cassie, you. Um, so the last, well, the last book I actually finished was Blacktop Wasteland because I read that one today. Um, I hear that one's good. No, yeah, that was so good. Obviously gave that one five stars. <laughs> What's it about? <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> um, and then, so I, I'm going to be honest, I, you guys know that I'm the kind of person who I procrastinate because I do a lot of things. And so I save things till the last minute. So, um, I had two podcasts to re- record today. So I had to read two books for <laughs> different podcasts today. And I did that. Um, Holy and they're they were completely different, which is cool because sometimes if you're reading similar things, you know, it, it's a little, you can get crossed over or even if you're not crossed over, you can sometimes just be like, wait, was this character from this one? Or so the other one was like a YA book about like vampires or something from the nineties though. So we're totally good. Um, Pimp and then your pa- podcast lady. 
Oh, yeah. Well, so I am on a podcast called The Pike Cast. It's dedicated to Christopher Pike, who wrote like thrillers and horror books in the 90s. Thanks, Pat. Um, and then aside from those two, I, last night I actually finished Salt Blood by T.C. Parker, who is Natalie Edwards. Um, she also writes crime fiction under her real name, Natalie. And then she writes horror under T.C. Parker. Um, and Salt Blood, this is my first time reading anything by her. And she sent me four books. So two of the crime ones and then two of the horror ones. And I started this one thinking like, oh, I'm just going to read a little bit before bed. And I I stayed up until like 2 a.m. And my boyfriend was like, you need to go to bed. Like you, you have to wake up in a couple of hours. Like you literally have to sleep right now. So I got the book taken away from me until the next day. And yeah, that one was really good. So I would definitely recommend that to anybody listening. Um, and I think the last one, I don't I don't think I, I don't know if I mentioned I think I might have mentioned the mushroom one, um, The Beauty by Leah Whiteley. I read that. Uh, like two weeks ago, I think, or three weeks ago. And it was so good that I immediately bought like myself a copy, like physical. And then I bought one for my boyfriend and for my boyfriend's best friend because he likes sci-fi. And I was like, if I can get anybody into horror, like from something as a gateway, like it's going to be sci-fi and I'm going to gross them out with some weird shit. So that's what I went for. Hopefully everybody likes it. Um, but yeah, who's next? Brennan, did you go? Yeah. Yeah, no, I did not go yet, oh, but thank you for throwing us. it to me. <laughs> uh, for, first off, you know, a couple compliments to you. I mean, the just being able to start two books and finish them, um, like that's that's pretty wild, you know. Like I, I, I don't think I have that in me. Um, I, and I'm and I'm glad you mentioned T. C. Parker because that's that's a name I keep seeing come up. Um, uh, was it Natalie Edwards? Did you say? Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's yeah. awesome. I've talked to her privately and she's just such a sweet person. Yeah. And and I just keep seeing great things about her books. I've got to pick them up. Um, my main thing I'm, I'm, I'm in right now, uh, Pat mentioned, is uh, Alan Baxter's The Gulp. Um, and I'll take a minute because you didn't you didn't really explain what it is, but it's a uh, mosaic novel. It's a uh, it's five novellas about this small town in Australia called Gullpepper where weird shit happens. Um, and I'm two novellas into the five and he nails that like weird shit in a small town vibe. Um, even just two novellas in, uh, there's a little bit of overlap, you know, mentioning a character or a random like weird ass figure in the streets that was, uh, you know, showed up in novella one in novella two. Um, it's a good one. And, you know, I I pick up something with Alan's name on it. I already know I'm going to like it. You know, I, I've never read anything by him that was that was less than stellar. So I already knew it was going to be good. And I'm anxious to see what else he has in store for me with this one. Fantastic. Um, before we leave, is there anything that you want to talk about, mention, or I can't imagine there is, but at the same time I can, Sean. <laughs> is there anything that... We have not asked that you want to bring up. Um, yeah, no, uh, you guys did a good job of like picking my brain. Uh, most people ask me, like, uh, what did I do before I became a writer or what's my day job? But that's cool. I mean, that's not a big deal. I work at a, I, my day job is I work, I'm a, a, an attendant at a funeral home. And uh, that's why my darkest prayer is set in a funeral home. Uh, and uh, I have, and I've never seen any ghosts and I've never seen anybody move yet. Um, so, uh, I'm waiting on that with bated breath. Uh, I'll take this moment while well, I got a second, talk about, um, a couple of writers, uh, that are com I'm coming up, that have books coming out next year that I really think people should look out for. Um, there's a writer named Yasmin McClinton, who has a, uh, hit a, uh, an assassin type book about, a a, a character that grew up in Ghana who learned to be an assassin, uh, with the the, the civil wars in 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 that in in Africa and uh, that's coming out next year. Uh, that's going to be really good. Uh, Heather Levy, who has written a book called Walking Through Needles, which is a really dark and twisted psychological thriller, coming out from Polish Press next year. Uh, people should really be on the lookout for that. She's a very interesting person. I got to meet her at Bouchicon last year, and uh, she's really. Uh, I hope that we get to have conventions again because Heather Levy is fun to hang out with. But she's very funny. Um, very, very intelligent person. Uh, and I, I and, and, uh, she's just a hoot to be around, but she wrote a book called Walking Through Needles, which is coming out next year. Um, and a friend of mine, uh, uh PJ Vernon, he wrote a book called Bath House, which the tagline for that is, uh, Grinder meets Gone Girl. And I'm telling you, I've read that book and that is a very apt description. Um, so if you like, uh, thrillers, uh, 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 suspense thrillers. That's that's coming out next year. That's really good. 
And I just wanted to say thank you to you guys for having me. Uh, this has just been such a great experience uh, with everything going on right now with COVID and all that kind of stuff. I don't really get to see anybody. So I either talk my cat to death and she's kind of sick of listening to me. So it's great to have a really good conversation with the folks and that just let me, uh, you know, uh, just, you know, regurgitate all the things that are swirling around in my head about like anybody that knows me that ever hung out with me in person and Ed and, and Gam can probably tell you this. I get a couple of drinks in me. I can talk about writing all freaking night. So thank you guys for indulging me and letting me, uh, uh, run off at the mouth. Like I said, I have sometimes have, uh, you know, uh, I sometimes have what my mom will used to call a fast lip and I, I'll just <laughs> talk you to death if you let me. So thank you guys for having me and thank you guys for indulging me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Sean, I'm not exaggerating when I say we've enjoyed every damn thing you had to say tonight. Yeah. Um, and I would love to ask you if you'll come back uh, to promote Razorblade Tears or anything else you've got in the pipeline. But I'm not going to ask you because that, you know, gives you the possibility to say no. So I'm going to tell <laughs> you, you're going to come back, man. <laughs> I would love to come back and talk to you guys. Again, this is great. This has been so much fun, man, and and just getting to chat with all three of you guys. And like I said, I have such varied interests, so it's cool to get to talk about my horror interests and my horror. Like I said, you know, I started out wanting to be a horror writer. I wanted to be the next Kyle Barker, and, and you know, and somebody told me, well, no, just be the next, be the Sean Cosby, and that's what you got to do. But you know, I I've got a lot of horror ideas that I want to write. Uh, maybe I'll do like uh, uh, TC does and write them under a pseudonym because. Uh, uh, I almost did that with my. Um, I wrote a. Uh, I wrote a locker room mystery for Ellery Queen magazine last year, and I almost wrote that under a pseudonym because you know my brand is people getting hit in the face with wrenches, and that's not really uh, what Ellery Queen is all about. So I wrote a locker room mystery about an impossible crime for them. But uh, I, I do have some horror ideas. I, I got this hard. I, I'll let you guys go after I tell you this. I got this horror novel that I've been working on for like years that I haven't finished called the uh, the Preacher Man, and, and it's about uh, <laughs> it's about this guy who uh, is in an insane asylum and he's being interviewed by a podcaster, ironically, and he tells him the story about this this minister that came to his small town and he uh, he was it ends up the minister is like this demon that infects the women in the town. He's like this really good looking guy, but he's also this demon and he infects them with this demon seed that takes 25 years to uh, to gestate. And uh, it's like this really dark kind of body horror, uh, but also Southern Gothic horror novel. So that's maybe in the future if I get some time and I get a break, I'll, I'll work on that. I'd love to come back and talk to you guys about that. But again, yeah. thank you guys for having me. This was so much fun. I really enjoyed it. And I enjoy talking to all three of you guys. And, and please uh, don't hesitate to reach out to me again. I'd love to come back. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, where can people follow you? You can follow me. I don't have a website yet because I am uh, old school. And uh, But I do. you can follow me on my author's page at S.A. Cosby Author on Facebook. You, If you want to see my midnight ramblings when I'm uh, pissed off about a plot that doesn't want to work and I make crazy tweets at 2 a.m. You can follow me on Twitter at, at BlackLionKing73, which I am I have a really foul mouth on Twitter, so be prepared. Um, <laughs> and uh, anybody that's stressed I do, I'm, I'm, my Twitter feed can get, get wild because I'll start drinking this and then I'll start talking crazy. But um, <laughs> um, uh, uh, you can also reach me through uh, uh, Macmillan Publishing and Flatiron. I love hearing from people that read the book. I get a lot of really cool emails from folks that read the book and they're really heartwarming people that have connected with the book. I get a lot of weird emails, too, <laughs> from people that have really connected with the book in a way that is uh, sort of creepy. I, I've gotten more than one email from someone who uh, sends me a picture of them reading the book in their tub so you know it's all good but uh anyway yeah if you want to reach out to me hit me up on twitter hit me up on facebook maybe one day i'll actually build a website so that's where folks can find me cassie For audio listeners uh sean is holding a or was holding a bottle of jameson and if uh you know jameson would like to send a couple bottles our individual ways for promoting them <laughs> they can reach out by the podcast email and we will be happy to send them our addresses 
Uh, it just so happens that uh, two of us are super Irish, so like it makes sense. Cassie, thank you for joining us. Thank As you always, for having me. Brennan, thank you for being my uh, best friend slash co-pilot. Sorry, nailed it. Labels on you now forever. Wait, no You're... best friend for me? Hold on. Oh, wait, Hold wait. On. That's, that's no, rude I as shit, I always man. dig a hole for I'm just myself a, in a every guest episode. host, and Brennan, you're the best friend slash oh, co-host? fuck. I know. It Holy really, smoke. it really, like, digs deep. Oh, it no. does. I feel oh, this nerds. pain. I don't know if I can get over this. I'm going <laughs> to edit it so it sounds like Brennan said that. Don't Sean... you dare. <laughs> <laughs> Sean, thank you for joining us. Like I, uh, I did fanboy over you because uh, you're. I did it with Gabino. I did it with uh, Jonathan Mayberry. I did it with Josh Mallerman. There's just something about awesome people that write awesome stories. So uh, I appreciate you spending two hours with us. And uh, oh, last man. thing is, is I'm I... sorry. I kept you guys up. <laughs> sorry, I kept you guys up so late. I apologize. No. No, I'm going to be writing after this. I can't speak for them, too. I don't know what they're doing, but uh, I uh, I love Jameson as well, so better watch out. If I see it, scares the care, sir. I may buy you a drink, and we may talk for five hours. <laughs> so thank you for your time. Listeners, I, I thank you. All right with that, man. I, w- I look forward to it. And again, thank you guys for having me, man. I appreciate it so much. Absolutely. Uh, it was a blast. We'll have Sean on whenever he wants. Uh, and uh, listeners, thank you for joining us. Next week, uh, the Monday after you listen to this episode, will be our final. We will have Aaron Dries, where we have a guest host, Mary San Giovanni, the queen of cosmic horror. So stay tuned for that. You may get a few extra things at the end of that episode. Have a good one.